Hey everyone, Les Moskaliuk here, that little ed tech guy. Welcome back to the Google uh, Certified Educators Level 1 Bootcamp. Um, hope you're all happy to be back. It was uh, great to have you yesterday. We had a great session. Um, I think for most of you, uh, you filled in the survey. I got some great feedback uh, coming from you. So uh, starting off today's session, it's going to be jam packed. We got a lot of information that we got to cover. We have about 12 units of material that we're going to go through. Uh, so um, hope you're ready for it. If you don't mind, I see the, the chat is already uh, started to fire up. If you don't mind, uh, introduce yourself, put your name, which we can see uh, your name there and uh, maybe put where you're coming from. Uh, so we have an idea of where you are in the world. And again, if you have uh, a Twitter handle, please uh, add your Twitter handle. All right. Um, I'm happy to hear that we got uh, some people from all over the world. Uh, it was incredible yesterday. We had uh, people from Mexico. We had people from Canada, the U.S. We had a bunch from Kuwait. Um, we had some joining us from the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's incredible um, technology these days and how we can reach out and, and collaborate and, and share. Uh, sometimes things don't always go the way we want, and um, I appreciate the, the feedback that you guys shared in those comments. We're going to do uh, our best today to ensure that we meet the needs of you. Um, but again, um, we got a lot of information and we're going to go through it. So we're doing part two of our boot camp. Uh, oops, wrong screen that I was clicking there. Again, my name is Les, Mos Les Moskaluk. Uh, I am a Google certified trainer. Uh, I work in Kuwait at the American United School of Kuwait. I see we got a couple other AUS people joining us. Um, I'm a Canadian guy who uh, decided I need a little bit of a change. I had uh, the greatest job in the world. I had the dream classroom, if you will. And uh, after about seven years of teaching, uh, I just needed a break. So my wife and I took a leave of absence and decided to try out Kuwait. And 11 years later, we got the travel bug. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to travel around the world. And um, uh, Kuwait has uh, become home for us. So I'm sharing with you uh, in the conversation, uh, in the chat, the slide deck so that you guys can follow along. Um, Yesterday, we briefly talked about um, PLNs, and I kept talking about how important Twitter was and how you should uh, be involved with, with Twitter. Uh, I work at a school, and um, you know we're big on our, our PLCs, our professional learning communities, and as, as teams and groups, we're always meeting together, we're always collaborating, we're always sharing. It, but it's really, really hard yesterday, again, as I said, to, to find things that fit your needs. Um, you know, one of the biggest complaints that I have as a technology teacher is that there is uh, very little, and I'm in Kuwait, so there's very little technology uh, professional development that's available to me um, within my community, especially in Kuwait. Uh, I give lots of it, but I, it's very hard for me to receive lots. And uh, unless I travel and, you know, unless I go places, I mean, travel uh, PD is, is always an issue with schools and, you know, now more than ever. But finding your own professional uh, community is extremely important, and, and that's what Twitter does. So I'm not here to be an advocate of Twitter, but I have to tell you that, that Twitter for me is um, a total game changer. And I know uh, for those of you that are, that are in Kuwait, for those of you that, that don't social network, uh, that aren't um, you know, social media people, it, it's a tough sell. You're like, you know, I, I couldn't be bothered. Um, but once you get involved with Twitter um, and you tailor um, the needs of, of what you're looking for, again, Twitter becomes a total, total, total game changer. So uh, showing you on my uh, screen, um, this was you know, huge for me uh, when I woke up this morning. Uh, I'm teaching you know, uh, virtually next year and 
as a technology teacher and, and teaching um, some design technology, I'm struggling with what I'm going to do with my students and what type of you know curriculum I'm going to do and, and how am I going to meet the needs of the students. And I woke up this morning to um, a post from Google for Education saying, hey, we've listened to the teachers and we're taking the, the Google applied skills, uh, the digital skills for students, which teaches students the basic needs of, of how to use Google and how to use digital citizenship. Um, and we're connecting that with Google Classroom so that you as teachers uh, can teach these skills because they know that there's gonna need to be a little bit of filler within um, you know, the curriculum and, and teachers are gonna have a hard time teaching students virtually how to use Google Documents or Google Sheets or Google Forms or how to connect through Google Classroom, um, it's going to be difficult. So, you know, Google Listen. And again, I woke up this morning and boom, here's this great piece of information that, I mean, I, I probably would have heard about it because I'm a Google trainer, but it just it showed up in my Twitter feed because I follow Google for Education. And it was like, wow. And if I show you, I use a thing called TweetDeck. Um, TweetDeck just kind of shows me uh, what I tailor my feeds to. So as I start following people, as I start uh, connecting with people, and you know, I don't just randomly follow you know whoever it may be. But what I do do is, I, as I end up following other uh, Google trainers or Google innovators or ed tech coaches or you know really important people, and I wake up to this wealth of knowledge every single morning that is oftentimes uh, a little overwhelming for me, and I just can't get enough of it. And, and what's happened this summer, and thankfully, well, kind of, I'm stuck in Kuwait. I didn't get to home, go home for Canada, so thankfully for me, um, this summer has been literally a summer of, of personal professional development, but I mean, I have to pause and, and stop for a second because there's so much free PD that's out there through Twitter um, that my wife is like, hey, buddy, um, you know, you, you need to put in some quality time with me. We're supposed to have a date night tonight. And I'm like, yeah, but there's this awesome, there's this awesome webinar tonight. I can't miss it. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, that you create a Twitter handle and you get on Twitter. If you have Twitter right now, uh, I'm going to do it. And I hope you guys do it. What I would love is if you um, grab your camera and I'm going to take a selfie right now. Give me one second here. Oops, switch my camera around. I'm taking a selfie of me in the class today. And um, I'm gonna end up posting that up um, on Twitter. And uh, same with you guys, if you don't mind, um, take a selfie uh, of you being in that class. And this isn't props for me. I'm not trying to brand myself or anything like that. But as you grow, um, you know, you want to start following certain things. One of the ones that you do want to follow is Grow with Google um, and Google EDU. And I read a great quote this morning uh, or this afternoon um, as I was reading my tweet deck, which was uh, a Google tip a day keeps the Microsoft away. So uh, get on Google or on Twitter and, um, you know, again, that wealth of knowledge is going to come to you. So uh, let's get started. We have Pete in the background. Uh, she's going to moderate uh, some of those questions. And if you have questions, she's going to do her best to answer them. We'll limit how much gets popped up on the screen so we don't distract you. Uh, I know that there is a brief delay between uh, StreamYard and going to YouTube Live. It's, it's about 7 to 10 seconds. So, um, you know, be patient with us. All right, uh, again, just some uh, norms. Have your coffee ready. Um, I got mine. It's going to be a long night. Uh, this is going to be a recorded session, uh, so you will be able to go back. It usually takes about three hours for the entire uh, broadcast to show. And um, in reading some of the comments that you guys made in the survey yesterday, uh, or maybe you filled in the survey this morning, uh, people were like, I can't find the information. I, I can't find the links uh, to some of the comments or, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, you need to, and uh, let me uh, do this. I can't go to a live broadcast right now on YouTube. 
um, because it's it's going to lag the StreamYard. But uh, if you look at your chat, what you will see at the top of your chat is it says top chats. And those are the people who make the most comments. And then you will also see um, all chats. So if you go to the um, the pre-recorded, the, the, the post-recorded uh, YouTube video, and you're looking for the chats, again, the chats usually take about uh, a day for them to populate uh, to Google, but they are there. So the video will prompt, not all of it will be there. And then, you know, probably within four or five hours, Google will have the entire video and mostly the live chat that'll be propagated in there. So uh, it will be there for you um, that you can watch. And, and more importantly, you can go back to um, reviewing the content. Oops. All right. Um, let's uh, get googly for a second. I have a Google form. Uh, that is, I need to share with you so that we can uh, get a little bit of information. I'm going to go to a Google form and all of you um, may or may not have used a Google form before. I don't remember who the person was yesterday in the comments, uh, but they had posted, uh, you can use a shortener in Google form and you can. So I'm going to send the form to you guys and, and this way you'll also see um, one of the Google form chats that we'll talk about later on, but it, that is sending a, a shortened URL specifically from uh, Google forms. So if I click the send button and I click on the hyperlink button right here, you will see that I'll get the long uh, Google URL. And if I click this button right here, shorten URL, it's gonna shorten it to a much shorter URL. So I'm gonna copy this one and I'm going to go to my live stream here. Patience, i got to switch screens. I'm going to paste it in there. And if you will, um, it is a simple Google form that asks you a couple questions. Your email address and uh, your first name, your last name, today's date. What was the hardest thing that you faced yesterday? Here is a simple way that um, not only am I teaching you the the tools, but um, for virtual learning. Um, I use uh, Google Classroom often as a check-in, but you can use Google Forms as a social emotional check-in for your students and saying, how are you feeling today? Uh, happy, sad, overwhelmed, I'd rather not talk about it. Uh, so quickly fill in that form, and then later on when we get to Google Forms, I'm gonna use this uh, information that you have completed uh, so we can look at the analyzing the data, okay? So I know some of you in the comments said, I got lost yesterday. I was uh, clicking someplace and then I got lost where you are. And I also didn't recognize uh, where you were clicking. Unfortunately, I'm using StreamYard and StreamYard doesn't give me a little highlighter like a Screencastify or Loom uh, or WeVideo does. Um, so if you uh, are not sure about where to click, uh, I'll try and slow it down um, so that, or I'll try and repeat myself so that you know exactly where you got to go. Okay, so um, fill in the forms, please, and um, we will continue on. All right, Jammy Jam, uh, I've given you the the jam, Miss Pete. If you don't mind, if you can throw the the jam link up in the chat as well. Um, the jam again is another, uh, way that you can do that social emotional wellness check-in. Uh, here's the jam link. If you click on it again, for those of you, uh, who may not, uh, participated yesterday and are joining us today, um, all I am asking you is to just quickly Create a sticky note and put your name, if you don't mind, maybe where you're coming from. Today I'm gonna say Canada because I sure wish I was at home sitting on my dock or sitting in my boat um, with a line in the water, maybe catching a fish and put in your Instagram or your Twitter. Twitter, I don't want Instagram, I don't do Instagram. Um, 
put in your Twitter address and throw it in there. All right, and um, Dominique says it's taken you to Facebook. All right, let me give you the jam look link just in case. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, if you got the wrong link, uh, you should be good to go. Cool. We got um, Ohio. We got people from Texas. I love it. I love it that we have people from all over the world. All right. Again, uh, Jamboard is uh, just an awesome tool. Um, it is limited. Uh, yesterday, we had a few people that said that they couldn't connect, and that is because Jamboard uh, max out at about uh, 50 people. But uh, again, it is one of those great tools um, that you can use. And if you're following me, if you don't mind, press that subscribe button on uh, your YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to have probably in the next two weeks a wealth of videos uh, that are going to be created all about different teaching practices and the Google tools uh, that may help you and assist you get ready for, uh, you know, your new uh, semester in virtual learning. All right. What are we doing today? Woo! A whole bunch of information. We're going to do an overview of Google Chrome and what you need to know for the test in Google Chrome. We are going to go through Google Forms, go through Google Sheets, Google Classroom, Google Sites, Google Keep, Calendar, Google Hangout Meets, YouTube, Drawings, the Google Groups and Communities, and uh, G+, which uh, has just changed in the last couple days. Uh, it is now called uh, Currents. So I'll discuss that for you as well. Um, all right, let's get started. If you guys have the uh, slide deck and you're following along, um, hopefully maybe you have split screens. If not, I would suggest maybe uh, open up two browsers so, and split them in half so that maybe you want to follow along and, and work on um, one uh, look at the Chrome or the, sorry, the slide deck and at the same time, uh, be able to look at uh, your browser so maybe you're following along and uh, participating in doing some of these tasks. So let's have a look and see what we're doing for Google Chrome. In Google Chrome, again, I need to uh, remind you some of the people were um, asking yesterday in the chat that uh, you know some of the information was linked to uh, the teacher center. Um, you know, one comment was, well, you're giving us resources, but the resources are already posted on the Google websites. And I agree with that. Um, I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. What I am here to do is share this wealth of knowledge with you so that you can best um, navigate the test. So the reason why I've given you this slide deck and the reason why I made for you uh, that resource sheet at the end was so that during the test, if you happen to have difficulties, you don't have to go through a whole bunch of information and try and find that information. You literally could have the slide decks open up as additional tabs and you know click on Google Chrome and go right to the Chrome browser or go to that unit within the test that I gave you and it'll take you directly to the Google support site. Okay, It's not about creating a whole bunch of additional resources that are just going to um, confuse you, but it's just a matter of uh, you know making sure that you have the information. Okay, uh, someone's asking me. I see Jessica. Um, you know, Jessica can't see me today, and I'm doing that, Jessica, because yesterday I had a request uh, from one of the teachers that was the screen was too small and uh, they couldn't see the entire screen. So uh, what I'm doing is just making it uh, a little bigger and presenting my whole screen so you can hear my voice and um, be able to look at this 
you know, so that it's a much clearer picture. If you guys want to see my voice or see my picture, that's great. Here I am. I'll stay on the video for you. No problem. Um, I had to give myself a COVID haircut because the barbershops are still closed here. So I'm not looking so uh, sexy these days. Um, but I'm going to go back to broadcasting the big screen. All right. Um, let's get to Google Chrome. I'm going to go between multiple browsers again. Uh, so that I can demonstrate what we need to uh, do. So in Google Chrome, uh, the first thing we need to do is learn how to sync our uh, Chrome browser uh, with your profile. We need to manage our bookmarks. We need to know what incognito mode is. We need to be able to access the Chrome Web Store and get those amazing uh, extensions put on. Um, and be able to install extensions and apps from the Chrome Web Store. So let's jump into doing that. I'm going to oops, exit out of this screen, and I'm going to open up a new browser tab. So again, we're looking at um, Google Chrome right now, and I'm hoping that Google Chrome is your uh, your go-to if, if you're using... Uh, Google Classroom and your school is a Google EDU school. Uh, I'm hoping that you know you're a nonstop 100% Google user. And the reason why you should be using Google Chrome or the Chrome browser is simply because everything is linked together. So if you notice up here, um, and many of you may have noticed this, and I can't do this right now because I'm signed in to multiple accounts, but when you open up your Chrome browser on a new tab, Generally, what you see here is uh, a sign in button. And if it doesn't say sign in, it's going to have a little circle with your generally your profile picture. What you'll also notice is you will see that this right here shows up as an L, and this says less G trainer. I can navigate between my users in here and um, manage my users. So if you're a teacher and you're at school and you're using your teacher account all the time and then you have your personal Gmail account, um, you can flip between browsers. And one of the best parts about it is that your browsers will sync all of your data. So if you watch right here, um, I can scroll down and it shows um, different people that are already in there. And here I have my... Um, Moscow you could dot less trainer account and then here's my school account and then this is just a test account I created I could go on guest or if I wanted to add another one if I wanted to add my my personal Gmail I could just add right here and it would allow me to add another user now what happens is if I click on this button right here and go to this one what you will see in the bookmarks oops uh, it's not doing it because I have all these tabs open. If I open up another Chrome browser from this window right here, you will see that um, up in the top right-hand corner, there's my little uh, less the ed tech guy picture and then also signed in. But what you'll notice here is that all of my book bookmarks are saved under this profile. And again, all you need to do is when you sign in, you just need to click here and you just swap between the two or three or four or five. Okay. And again, um, that's going to make your life a little easier on um, managing this. When you take the test, please uh, sign out or remove yourself. And you can do that by clicking the Chrome tab and here's a way where you can um, add people or you just click this and if you don't want it to be there anymore you can go remove uh, that person so if i didn't want this little fox less test i could go remove this person and it's gonna remove all that information that is synced with my profile okay so again that's important to to know it's not something that is specifically on the test, um, but it's more so just for your preference and it's going to make your life a whole lot easier. Um, so 
if you remove a person from here, that doesn't mean that it deletes your content. It just deletes you from this Chrome browser. And the moment you sign back in again, and you add another managing profile here, all of your data, it's gonna ask you, do you wanna sync this data? And you go, yes. And again, the perk to that is uh, I use um, Google Chrome on my mobile phone. So whatever I do on my mobile phone, if I add a bookmark, it's automatically added to uh, this profile as well, depending on what user I'm signed in on. So that's one of the best parts as well. Uh, for managing your uh, or managing and syncing your Chrome browser. All right, bookmarks. Everybody loves bookmarks. Bookmarks are the greatest thing, uh, except <laughs> as we, um, you know, continually go to new websites, we always bookmark, 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 and then I look back and I have bookmarks from like ten years ago, and I'm like, sheesh, I gotta, I gotta organize these. Um, you know, and, and make sure that they're managed properly. And it's often one of those things that we never really do. It's, I'm, oh, it's a summertime to-do list thing, and then you just never get to it, and you push it off. But try and keep your bookmarks up to date. We'll talk about them in a second. I see Candace asked the question, why do we want to sign out of our accounts for taking the tests? Um, great question. Thank you for that. The reason for that is that by signing out of all the accounts, your only account that you're gonna be signed into is the test taking account. And that is gonna eliminate uh, all possibilities of you getting any errors, okay? Uh, <clears throat> again, I wanna ensure success for you. And there's a lot of issues right now that are happening, whether your your web connection is, is not stable or you, you know have a, a small power outage or anything like that. You wanna be able to, you know, if you have a power outage, you need to be able to sign in. Boom, everything else is signed out except that one account you can sign back in again. So essentially all you're doing is you're just eliminating uh, the variables to have the you know possibly the best chance of gaining success. It's not mandatory, um, but it's gonna help your chances, okay? So thank you for asking that. Um, I led you guys astray there in doing that. All right. So let's say we want to bookmark something. Let's say we go to um, Les Mosley's YouTube page. And uh, this is you know, just a, a great website with a, a ton of um, you know, resources <laughs> as I'm you know, trying to promote myself. I wanna get to 100 subscribers. If I get to 100 subscribers, I get to change my name here that says that little ed tech guy instead of this uh, UCU uh, blah, blah, blah. So, um, if we get to a website and, and we want to bookmark a website, it's extremely easy. All you need to do is just go and press this star button. And when you press the star button, it's going to ask you, where do you want to bookmark it? Do you want to put it in your bookmarks bar? And for those of you that are unclear what the bookmark bar is, it is right here. And for some of you right now, if you're scratching your head and going, I don't, uh, here we are in, in Kuwait, shouldn't have a, um, what do you mean? What, what's this? I don't, I don't have a, a bookmark bar. Um, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that simply could be because your bookmark bar is hidden. And again, one of those um, little tools that uh, Google has, we have the waffle or the apps button, but let's call it the waffle. And then uh, what a lot of people refer to as the three dots or the snowman. If you click the snowman and you go to bookmarks, you have these options right here that says show bookmark bar. So if I uncheck this right there, I no longer have a, uh, a bookmark um, bar, but I would highly suggest that you keep your bookmark bar. So again, I'm gonna go show bookmarks right there, okay? Um, so you've bookmarked uh, less Moss League, and then let's say you go to the uh, Twitter handle and you're like, yeah, I wanna, click on this one, I'm not sure why you, you would, I mean, maybe you wanna go to your Twitter homepage and, and let's bookmark this. So I'm gonna bookmark this tab as well. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put this in my bookmarks bar. Um, or maybe you want to start sorting your bookmarks, which you'll have to do in the test uh, and create different folders. You can do that by clicking the more button. Oh, uh, here, here we go. One second. 
Um, thanks for that, Salt8178. Let me just go to this, and I'll take that off. Boop. There we go. All right. Um, if we go to bookmarks, you'll see a more button. And then essentially what more does, it opens up a file hierarchy the same as it does with Google Drive, the same as you've seen in your Windows Explorer. This is where you can now start creating new folders in your bookmark. So in your bookmark bar, you could right now go new folder. And I'm going to call this uh, AUS staff sites and go save and what you'll see right here is i have a folder now that pops up on there so if i go to another website and i'll share this with you guys after if i go to save i can say that i want to save this one in the aus staff sites and go done now the problem with this is that right now it's in a folder so uh you have to click on the folder and then you will we'll see um, those links within that folder. So again, this is uh, one way that uh, you can organize your life. You're going to have to, um, on the test, uh, create and manage your bookmarks. Now, if you really want to get into the, the deep of it, you just go back to the snowman or the three dots and go to bookmarks and then click bookmark manager. And then your bookmark manager will open up your web browser and it will allow you to go through and uh, edit, remove all those. So if I didn't want this anymore, I can just click on the dots. I can change the name of it. Uh, so oftentimes, uh, here I'll give you an example. We use uh, Redeker or uh, Plus Portal for uh, our grading system. So when you try and bookmark that it just goes it's got this super long url and i don't want that url i just want it to be uh something simple so maybe i'm going to change this to lm uh, yt and it may that might seem to you like well why would you label it as lm and just because i know it but it also has the youtube label in there so i often shorten uh, the names or the bookmarks in my bookmark bar just so that I can have more uh, bookmarks that are you know one click away you can also right click and go to edit to change uh, the name of it as well and managing it so this is my uh, Google admin council uh, to set up uh, a Google system within a school and I know that that what that is so I could just say admin, and I know that when I click on this, it's going to take me to the Google admin. If you want to delete, uh, you just simply cut them and it's gone, or right click and you can press the delete or cut button. And again, that's just simply managing your bookmarks. Okay. Um, bookmark stuff, and uh, same as you would normally do within your Google Classroom and your Google Drive uh, file things that are organized. And uh, don't let your um, your bookmarks kind of run away on you and, and be like mine where if you click on it, I have stuff from years ago because I always say I'm going to get to it. And then I start doing something else and you know get sidetracked. So um, make sure you know your bookmarks. Incognito mode. Uh, some of you may know what incognito mode is. Some of you may not know what incognito mode is. but Basically what incognito mode is, is it's a window or a browser tab that um, doesn't record your uh, history or the websites uh, that you're using. It doesn't save any cookies. It doesn't save any cache memory. So it kind of basically goes into a private mode. It doesn't also uh, check your... Um, your username. So if you're ever wondering about sharing a file and you want to look at, you know, is this file going to be viewable to someone else, you can use incognito mode. And how you get to incognito mode is by just clicking on the three dots and you'll see it says new incognito window. And when you open it up, it goes black and you get the little spy glasses right here. 
if you use your uh, browser on your mobile phone or your Android devices or your iPhone, etc. Again, all you're going to see is you'll see this little uh, on the top right corner. You'll see this little looks like a spy guy uh, showing up here in your your browser or in your Omni box. Now, <laughs> this is important for you to know. It's not going to be on the test, but for you as a teacher, it's important to know. Uh, students love this and they think, ha ha ha, I'm going to be sneaky. Uh, it says Chrome won't save the following information, your browser history, cookies and uh, site data, information entered in forms, uh, your websites that you visited. So students see this and they're like, huh, if I just go in incognito mode, my teacher won't know. Most of your domains, um, your Google administrators, like me, um, we turn that off. So the students can open up incognito mode, but it doesn't mean that their history is not saved. Uh, so if you were in our school, I literally just click on browser history. When I say to a student, what are you working on? They're like, oh, I'm working on this project. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. Open up your history. Boop. Uh -huh. um, but for you as teachers, just know that, uh, I mean, that generally doesn't happen. But if you are trying to search for something and you don't want the search uh, information saved, then do that. Again, I think this is most often used not within a classroom setting for incognito, but more so for teachers um, or people who are sharing information to just say, hey, did I share this properly? Because a lot of times people will say, I'm trying to share this document and I don't know why it's not working. And then you open up an incognito mode and you copy the link and you paste it in there and you click on the link and it doesn't work. It's not the the end user's fault, it's that you didn't share the document properly. Um, so that's incognito mode. They, uh, they may ask you just to uh, open up an incognito mode and do a Google search. And again, their system tracks uh, your profile so they can see if you've opened up an incognito window and did a Google search in incognito or if you didn't, okay? So that's incognito mode, pretty straightforward. Um, easy to work around. Now, one of the things uh, that you're going to want to do, and it, I mean, it's going to be one of your best friends is if you, and I think most of you already know this, but um, a lot of people are still, you know, figuring things out uh, and making their way through Google and are, are new to Google. But when you look up at my Chrome browser at the end of the Omni box right here, you'll see that I have these things right here that, that pop up. And um, these are called extensions that I have uh, added from the Google Chrome store, which essentially is like, um, uh, sorry, essentially like uh, the iTunes store, or the, the app store, or whatever you may be. So I'm in the Chrome browser, and I, you might want to add some of these. If any of you are looking right now, uh, these are probably like musts. For, for next year is Screencastify, which is a screen capture tool. So it allows me to, uh, it'll take a video and allows me to do a screen capture and then it's automatically saved to my Google Drive. It's an awesome tool. The paid version is, I mean, it's cheap. Um, I think it's like 49 bucks or something like that. It's my go-to, uh, so I use it all the time, but uh, you can get the free version uh, and it'll allow you to record like five, uh, you know, five minutes or something like that. Uh, this one right here is Bitly. And as you saw in the uh, profile or at the beginning of the chat, we gave you uh, Bitly and then G Google Certified Educators Jammy. That's just a, a URL shortener if you want to make your stuff look pretty. The one nice thing about Bitly is you can track how many uh, views you had. So uh, for like the registration form that you guys signed up for it, it would allow you to, to go through that. Um, this is Loom. Uh, if you've never used Loom, Loom again is another screencast program. So it allows you to uh, take a screencast or video cast of your, of your desktop or tab or whatever you have on your computer. And then it again takes a video of you, puts you a little video in the corner so it's great for, for virtual teaching because if you're doing a quick micro lesson, you want to use Screencastify or you want to use Loom uh, or maybe your school is using WeVideo and you can do a, um, an in-screen video as well. I mean, there's a ton of tools out there, but my go-to is Screencastify or Loom. 
And then again, these are just uh, other extensions, Alex Keeler and, and my tweet deck. Um, but how do you get those? Okay. Uh, all you simply do is click on the snowman and you will see here more tools. And again, this is might be confusing because it goes relatively quick and then you want to click extensions. So again, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go in the top right hand corner, click on the snowman and go down to more tools and go to extensions. This is important to note. Um, if you are using a school issued device, uh, we, I say we, um, the Google admin team within your school or your IT team within your district or wherever you're coming from, they uh, can restrict what you can and cannot have. Uh, and a lot of districts will limit what you can add um, because of COPA laws and, and because of, um, you know, all different types of, um, you know, video recording and having students' voices and, and pictures and all that type of stuff and security issues and privacy issues. So your IT department is the best people to talk to before you start adding devices or maybe you have a form that you have to submit and say, I would like this and they do the security check on it. But in the meantime, um, you will see that you're either going to have uh, extensions that have automatically been pushed out to your school domain. But if you're using your own Gmail account, uh, the world is your oyster. I mean, it's open to you whenever, whatever you want to get. And in order to get these, what you'd have to do is go over to extensions. And this is what gets most people is you need to go over here to the open Chrome web store. If you go to extensions, this often just defaults to what's already there. Um, it doesn't go to the Chrome Web Store. So I know that's a little bit of a process, but you can go here, down to more tools, go to extensions, and then you got to click the hamburger. <laughs> here everybody's used it. We got waffles, we got now hamburger. We refer to these three lines as the hamburger. Click on the hamburger and then go down to the Chrome Web Store. And the Chrome Web Store is automatically, for the most part, if you're signed in with your profile in the Chrome browser, you don't have to sign in again because it tells me we're less at the G trainer at that little uh, ed tech guy. And then here's where you can find these, you know, um, extensions. So if you want to uh, insert Grammarly, which is a great tool, or share to classroom, don't share to classroom is an unbelievable add-on, but um, it's disappearing in the next couple months. So, um, you know, unfortunately it's, it's going away. If you got Zoom, if you want to do speed test, if you want to do Nimbus, Nimbus is great. But let's say you're looking for uh, Screencastify. Just type in Screencastify. Oops, I typed it wrong. Um, and it will give you a, a prompt that says, here's Screencastify. I already have it installed. Uh, so it says rate it. Um, and here, if I wanted to do this one, it says uh, edit this cookie. No. I, you would just go add to Chrome. If you do a, um, I'm not here to talk about extensions, but if you do a quick Google search for like the top 50 extensions or the top 10 extensions or must have extensions for educators in virtual learning right now, you're gonna get some great ones and, and add those to your browser. So they will ask you, um, I believe, to add an extension uh, just so that you are aware of how to do that. Hopefully, uh, that's clear for everyone. Um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat as it popped up, and I see, uh, is there any COVID-19 offers for educators? Uh, unfortunately, um, <laughs> ed tech programs, um, they, had the, they had the glass ball, if you will. Uh, they gave everything for free and uh, hook, line, and sinkered all the schools to, to use programs. And um, now as we move back into the, the new school year, most of the programs like Screencastify is free. There is a free version, but you're limited in time. But if you want the, the free version, uh, they're no longer offering it for free. That's going to be the same with Zoom. That's going to be the frame, you know, the same with a whole bunch of things with WeVideo, everything that was a great tool. Um, they gave it to us as a cookie to try, and now we fell in love with it. 
Uh, Bitmoji carry, if you don't know what that is, I'm going to leave you to uh, investigate it. It's awesome. If you see the, the craze right now of people making these avatar classrooms, uh, they're Bitmoji classrooms. Um, you can have a, a ton of fun with Bitmoji and the kids absolutely love it. Love it, love it, love it. Um, when you animate yourself, because I mean, at the same time with virtual learning, we need to make ourselves like the kids at the same time. So um, you need to know your extensions and navigating the Chrome Web Store. I hope that is um, relatively clear. Remember that the name of it is called Omnibox uh, in your search bar. So if I'm in Google Drive, again, this is an Omnibox. Um, and it allows you to search uh, through all of your files, all your emails, and everything. Uh, you're going to need to know uh, where the incognito mode is and how to add it. If you are logged in under a teacher domain right now, um, your school may allow a streaming video, but uh, you may not be able to uh, get incognito mode because they've blocked it. Uh, so you just need to check that. It just depends on, on how you're using it. But click the three dots and go to new incognito mode. Okay. All right. Let's get back to our session. That was uh, Google Forms, or sorry, uh, Google Chrome, and we are jumping into Google Forms. All right, with Google Forms, um, hopefully uh, you guys are using Google Forms. It is a unbelievable as assessment tool. It is a great way to collect data and um, monitor students and uh, a really simple way for uh, formative assessment. It's a great way just to do those simple check-ins and there is a ton of stuff that you can do with it. So uh, let's have a look at Google Forms. Let me close uh, Twitter. I want to open my tweet deck and see if you guys posted anything on there, but uh, well, I'll save that till after. But um, let's go to Google Forms. And if you remember for yesterday, or if you're joining me from yesterday, and or weren't here yesterday, in our Omnibox, we can type in forms.new. And that's one way for us to open up one of the productivity tools. So that'll automatically open up a new Google form for us. We can go to our waffle. And as our apps open up, we'll have Google forms. And if it's not in Google forms, you can go more. And as well, you also have the apps button up here. But uh, again, for me, whenever I'm creating a new document, it's way faster for me to uh, just type in uh, forms new, um, docs new, slides new, sheets new, Sites new, um, and away we go. So Google Forms, um, there is some basic stuff that you need to know with Forms is how to create a new form, uh, how to design and add some uh, uh, theme or character to it, uh, explore the different types of questions. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, how to add a YouTube video, how to add images, like the information that I shared with you guys. And then how to uh, view the responses, how to send it to a Google Sheet and analyze it, and then um, how to make a self-grading quiz. Again, a reminder, as you're looking at the tweet deck, uh, or the tweet deck, sorry, the slide deck that I've shared with you, uh, if you click this right here, that'll take you directly to the uh, Google support page that'll help you. Um, and it's current, obviously, so any changes to Google Forms. For those of you who use Google Classroom, you may have noticed, if you were, it was like last year, um, I'm a, a pretty googly person. I would con <laughs> consider myself pretty googly. I came back to school last year, and I was like, what, what happened to Google Classroom? Like, there's been 100 changes. I knew most of the changes were coming, but I was just floored. With there was so much, and, and it was nonstop, you know, teacher after teacher in my building going, well, what happened? Where is all this stuff? And um, a lot of it is the same with all of the, the tools in Google. Um, Google makes changes, they put on announcements, and maybe your tech team isn't sharing those announcements with you, but um, you'll always find current and relevant information through here. If there's a new issue or if there's a new update that's put out, in Google Forms, um, generally they don't put it into the test for about a year later. It takes about a year for them to add it to the test. They're not going to add it 
uh, automatically. So with everything that we're doing with Google Meet right now, you don't have to worry about it. We'll talk about that in a second. But again, um, going back to this, you also see that I've given you the tasks that we've talked about. So um, all the tasks are uh, scenarios that you may face within the test. So I would highly recommend that you go through this again. Um, this is a free session that I'm providing to you. So there's a wealth of information here. If you can manage these tasks within the, the task form, um, you'll do just well uh, on the test. All right, let's go back to Google Form and we're creating a new form. Remember that you want to uh, always label something, but one of the nice things about it is if you go to where it says untitled form, uh, I could call this Google Certified Educator L1. Oops, feedback. Feedback form. And here's where I may give a description. Um, the, the description might be for some of the people that they're joining us today. Uh, <laughs> and as a teacher, you always say, make sure you read the instructions properly. As I mentioned to you yesterday, make sure you read the instructions properly when you're taking the test. Uh, you know, this you might say, I need you to do this and this and this, or make sure you're using your personal email address uh, so that you can ensure that you have access to videos, etc. But the form description is just where you want to put information about what people may need to do within that, okay? Uh, from there, let's have a look at uh, a little bit of the layout. So as soon as I am done here and I click untitled question, um, you see that nothing's happened, that my form still stays the same. So if I go now, if you saw that, I went and moved my cursor up and I went and clicked on untitled and it automatically grabbed the name from here and, 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 and populated it at, up top so that I didn't have to type it twice, okay? So I always go in here and I type the name of what I want it to be and then I just click there. And remember from yesterday, you can star this so it's gonna go into your starred um, files in your Google Drive and we may want to put this in a specific folder like we did yesterday. So yesterday in the lesson, we were putting it into the Lesson Plans 2 folder. I'm using a different Google Drive today, but this is where I can move and I can allocate it to a specific folder within my Google Drive. And uh, here's test, because I'm using a test. And then I can go move here. So it's now staying, okay? So I'm gonna go move, good, there we go. So, um, Right here, we have just moved it. We've, we've basically set up our form. We know the, the saving location of where it's automatically gonna save to. A Google form, just like a Google Doc, a Google Sheets, Google Slides. The moment you press something, if I press the space bar, if you notice right up here where my cursor is, if, as soon as I press something, it automatically saves. So you never have to worry about that. So let's have a quick look before we start developing our form about creating the theme of it. Okay, and that right now is I'm gonna jump up over here and have a look at some of the functionalities that you can do. You see responses, and responses I'm gonna get to in a second because that's where we're gonna analyze the data. Here you see the color palette which says customize theme. And if I go to this, it allows me to choose a color. So if I wanted purple, if I wanted green, it allows me to do that. If you want to add your own uh, image that um, people are asking, here you just go choose image. But this is important. Uh, your header has to be a specific size. You can, Google has already templated some certain headers and uh, you can, you know, if you're looking for math class, you can go into your uh, different areas and say, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna make it like this, click insert, and you can populate it in there. You can also upload your own image if you would like. So if I remove this, you can see here it says upload. So uh, when you're creating forms, um, there's a certain size that you need to follow and you don't need to do that on the test where it says, you know, upload a, a specific 
uh, image, you just need to change a header and change the theme of your form. It might say add a you know picture of um, some beakers, which you know I kind of showed you right there. Um, but you have to just like a LinkedIn profile, just like a YouTube header or a Facebook header, you need to follow the size requirements of I, I can't remember what it is. It, it might be uh, 200 by 1920 or 1940 or something like that in pixels. Um, but if you do a quick little Google search, um, but this is the exact same uh, as um, you know most of your headers. So now you've just added something to make it a little more lively. And if you noticed, what happened was Google and its artificial intelligence, its AI, it automatically picked the theme colors from this. So it's basically taken the color scheme or the color palette that's in here um, and allowing you to kind of you know have everything that is roughly the same okay all right let's get to um creating uh here I'll, let's change this to playful because this is going to go for students and they like that um my recommendation always is to stay basic um but if you send it to the the little ones the little kitties uh, sometimes they like a little more uh, character to it <clears throat> all right Creating questions. Uh, all you simply need to do is type on one of the questions and start creating a question. Here's my first bit of information for you. Um, as you collect data, there's nothing more or there's nothing that drives me uh, insane, uh, <laughs> drives me a little crazy is when I get a Google form, uh, especially from, you know, something that's important, and it says name. And I'm going to put name just for right now, just so that you guys understand uh, what I'm trying to do and why I, I want you to do this. Uh, it says name. And then here it gives you an option of what type of response would you like. Now, again, Google Artificial Intelligence uh, will automatically kind of change that for you, but I can go to short answer, I can go to a paragraph, I can go to multiple choice, checkbox, drop down, file, upload, and we'll do some of these in a second. But right now I'm just gonna have it as a short answer. And this button right here allows you to make it required so that the students or the people within your domain, whoever you're using it to, uh, they have to answer this question before they submit the document. Again, these are important. Um, to have it. So here you put name and then I want to create another short answer question. So I already know that it's going to be a short answer question. I could put, uh, I could press this button right here that says duplicate. And what it does is it automatically goes name if it's going to be similar. Uh, and I can just put, maybe I'm going to put phone number. And I'll do that. And you'll see here that artificial intelligence through Google has already said, do you want it to be a number? And through this, you can validate their responses to make sure that they're actually putting in a number. Um, you may not want response validation, so you could just remove that and hope that they're gonna put in the responses that you want. So here I'm gonna make this one uh, not required. Now I wanna create more questions. I can go right here and go add questions. And as I do that again, it's going to give me uh, another question. And here's where you can choose multiple choice. So this is would be how are oops you feeling today? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to choose how are you feeling today? And uh, I want the kids to give me, you know, a class check-in. Happy. Well, I could just put happy. I could put sad, meh, and I want to hide in a corner, okay? So you could do that, um, and students could just simply choose the multiple choice. You could give them a drop-down menu, and if you wanting to see how your test is gonna look or how your form is gonna look, you click the preview button. So we click on preview 
And as you see here, I gave a drop down, so I could just say this right here. Uh, again, you may be doing something like um, teaching science, or maybe it's a math question. Uh, and maybe in science, you could say, please um, choose the mitochondria, or um, you know, 10 times 10 is 100. And you know, maybe you put different answers. But let me show you what else you can do with this. So I've clicked the preview button, and you will see that what it did is it prompted another Chrome browser tab. So here I have the, and this is important to notice, you have the view form, and that's what people are going to view and fill in. And then I have this one, which is the edit. So the edit is where you're actually editing the, um, you're editing the Google form, okay? So if I'm in the view form, because I am the author right now, you'll also notice in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you have this edit form. So if I click the pencil, it basically just takes me back to the edit mode, but now I have two edits open uh, and I don't need that. So I'm just gonna close this one right here. Um, Becky asks, are you able to add voice recordings? Uh, in Google Forms, the answer is no. However, there is an add-on, um, an extension that you can add to Google Forms uh, that will allow you to do that. I don't remember what the name of it is. I just saw it in my Google Trainer um, a chat about two weeks ago. Um, but right now, um, no, you can't. What you could do uh, is you could do a uh, Loom video, upload it to your Google Drive or Screencastify video and put it to your YouTube, which I'll show you uh, how to add a YouTube video or a video in a second. Um, but in the meantime, let's have a look here. I'm gonna go to drop down, but this is I'm gonna choose multiple choice. And because I've chosen multiple choice, you'll see that I go happy. And maybe with the happy, I wanna add pictures to them. So I have that um, awesome Google image search where I can just do happy and by using this Google image search, remember that it is safe search. So I can choose this one and go insert. And you will see that the happy face will show up. If I'm going sad, I can go do the exact same thing, Google image search. Add. Keeping the theme the same. I wonder what's going to show up for me. Eh. Eh. Not what I was after. Um, Not happy. I'm going to put emoji. Let's just choose this one for the sake of it. And just so that you guys can see this one, I'm going to go Google image search. I'm going to put angry. Oops. Center. And just like you guys saw on your uh, form, if I press the preview button, and I asked you, how are you feeling today? This allows them to choose this. So as you start developing your um, your tests, um, and we'll talk about self-grading tests in a second, uh, you're not just limited by multiple choice questions or uh, text-based questions. You can put images to them as well. Uh, if we go back to the edit mode, I'm gonna close this one because I have another edit window open. Uh, I can <clears throat> create a new question. 
I'm going to go new question. And in this, I can create a linear, a linear scale like I did for you guys of what is your understanding of 1 to 10? How do you feel about that? And you can label them. Um, you can create a multiple choice grid as well as check boxes. Date and time is always great. So uh, if you notice in the form that I had you guys create uh, for the post survey, it said put the date. And when I put date, it automatically makes you choose a date. Uh, so you have that functionality. One of the nice things is if you don't like that question, you want to delete it, you can delete it. If you want to move a question around, you will see that you get these six buttons up here. This allows you to drag it to the bottom and say, that's where I want that one. Or maybe you make a video and you're doing a flipped lesson and you want the kids to, uh, it's an exit slip for them. It's a homework assignment. And you say, Hey, listen, um, I want you guys to watch this YouTube video and then I need you to answer these questions. You can just create <clears throat> a, a link for adding a video and by clicking adding video, if you have the video, so again, if we typed in, I'll just type in my name, but well, okay, let's do this one. I think it's cells, cells, cells. So as I'm searching for this, I see a question that pops up. What is a flipped lesson? A flipped lesson is basically where you create content um, and then you send the kids home to do it. So uh, it's a great tool. I mean, right now, what we're virtually doing basically is a lot of flipped lessons in the sense that we are screencasting, let's say, um, lessons on how to do stuff and then the kids are doing it at home and then when they come back to a, a Google Meet uh, we ask them uh, the questions you know okay did you understand this did you understand that so a flip lesson allows the students to do it um, asynchronously on by themselves and then uh, as a teacher you're not just facilitating the information but you're now uh, checking for um, you know, their level of understanding, which oftentimes allows you to take it a little deeper. So I let's do cells, 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 um, the little rap song. And um, here we can just go parts of the cells. So at this point, um, they could just simply, when you go to the preview screen again, that YouTube video, um, luckily for you as a teacher, is embedded inside the uh, Google form and they don't see all the other stuff that, that comes outside of it. So if I press the play button, um, it's gonna play that video so the students will see that information and then you as a teacher um, and I'm not going to continue doing this but you could ask questions based on the video that they just watched so um, this is a great way to you know just reinforce learning again a great way to click uh, create a flipped lesson where you give them a video you say I want you to go home and watch this and then you know um, answer the questions so that you're doing just a check for understanding okay so great formative assessment tool. It's one that I often use um, just to check understanding and, and, and measure their understanding. It, it takes very little time and you could get it done extremely quickly. So here's the preview button and this is important. If you're gonna share information with the students, you need to make sure that you are sharing the form that says, or the window that says view form. So if you share this one, if you go, okay, here we go. Are you guys ready? I'm gonna share the Google form for you or I'm gonna share the test with you because you've created a test and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and you share the edit link with them, then it means that they can edit the content. They can also see all the information that's there. You don't want that. Um, you want to make sure that you're sharing this one right here by going view form. So you copy that and then you maybe paste that into your Google Classroom and away you go or you share it with your staff, or as I shared it with you guys and said, 
you know, please fill in this form so that you can collect the data. Um, you'll also see when we go here, you have a couple buttons which say settings. And in the settings, you can collect email addresses. So what that means is as soon as someone opens it, it's going to ask you, uh, please enter your email address. And if they don't put their email address, this is then they they can't submit it and it'll it'll check for validation to make sure that it is an email address um, you can't check that it's the correct email address um, but you can at least get look for that at symbol and then a dot with the domain in it uh, so if you're creating let's say a survey for your staff you may might not want to collect emails because then you're not really going to get you know Possibly, if it's supposed to be something that is, you know, with sensitive material, you may want it to be anonymous. And if it is anonymous, then don't collect uh, email addresses. If it's not anonymous, or maybe you're saying, hey, staff, we're going to do a, you know, a, a, a get together, a little mixer or something like that. What do you guys want? Who, what type of food do you want? Um, then go ahead. You can see that you have restrict users to that domain. And what this means is, only people within your school domain um, can can access this. So anybody outside wouldn't be able to fill in this form. So as teachers, uh, generally you want to check it off so that it's only people that are signed in with the school domain form. And then limiting to one response, this is something that you want to do, um, or maybe depending on what type of assessment that you're doing with the students or what, what, what type of uh, data you're collecting, from your uh, people at school, you may want to limit the amount of information or maybe you want them to go back and, and be able to submit multiple times. And then here you can edit and also see the summary. So um, if you click edit, uh, it'll allow them to be able to open their form again and make changes to it. And if the summary shows up, then this will show you uh, okay, this is what the staff decided so that there's transparency. So if you're doing, let's say, a, you know, um, you get the kids to democratically decide who's going to be the student president, which that is a bad idea because then you're going to see the percentages and maybe you don't want that so that the one kid who didn't get chosen doesn't get shown as, you know, 3%. Um, but you can have this option in there. Presentation. Uh, this will show you uh, the, a progress bar. So at the bottom of the Google form, it'll show how far you're going along. If you are creating a test, this is where you can shuffle the question order so that as each student opens up and is doing some type of either self-graded test, they can't just look at the other person's computer and, and see, okay, you're on the same question. At least it's going to limit um, the amount of cheating and then uh, show link to submit another response. You can uncheck this uh, so that once they completed it. Now, at the end of your Google form, you often want to leave a, some type of address or note or a thank you. And a lot of people don't do that, and it's simply because they don't know where to do this. But here is where you would just you type in. It's going to automatically default to your response is being recorded but you might want to write in a thank you for your response. Um, please check your email for confirmation, whatever it may be. Um, but that's how you uh, put a confirmation in there. And uh, again, it's another one of those just courtesies of being online. Um, a pet peeve of mine is, is people that just don't use netiquette um, or email etiquette. So, uh, as a teacher, you know, if you're asking your students to email you, um, you know, where they send you an email that says, hi, Mr. M, how are you today? Uh, I had difficulty with, you know, question so-and-so. I ask my students whenever they send me an email or send me a message that if they don't address me properly, I'm just going to delete it. I'm, I'm not even answering it because that's not how you send an email. So if my expectation is you know, that I ask the students to address me properly in an email, do so in the same when you're creating your Google Forms where you, you know, put a confirmation at the end and you're giving a salutation. So, you know, thank you, you know, from Mr. M or whatever it may be. And then you'll see here that uh, last one that says quizzes. 
And this is where it allows you to make a quiz. So um, many of you, uh, this can be a game changer for you, uh, especially just to do you know simple check-ins. Again, a, a phenomenal formative assessment tool, nothing that is a summative assessment where you know, you're looking for a hard grade or a big weighted grade, but just something to say, let me check their level of understanding. And you could make this a simple quiz and it automatically would grade this. So if I make this a quiz, I'm gonna get a few options. And one of them that you'll see here is that it's locked on Chromebooks. So if your school is using um, school managed Chromebooks, um, as soon as they open up a Google form test or quiz, every other browser tab is locked. They can't access anything else. If they try and exit out of it, then the teacher will get a message that says uh, so and so, you know, closed the test before they were done, or so and so tried to um, open up a new browser tab. So the teacher will be alerted to um, that. So it's one way to curb cheating uh, from the students. And that, again, that only works on school managed Chromebook devices. So if you're doing, let's say, a, a formative assessment and you want it to be on, on and you have this option in your class, you can go to lockdown mode um, and that'll allow you to do that. Here where it says immediately after submission, um, they're gonna get the responses or later. And the difference between the two, although this again isn't information that's on the test, I'm just helping you uh, through this right now, but immediately after submission means that most of the time you might have a simple form of assessment that is just multiple choice or true and false questions that um, you don't have to read the responses. If at any time you put short answer questions in there, then you need to go with later after manual review where you look, look at the responses and then decide whether the student you know, gets one mark or one and a half marks or whatever it may be. And then again, you can choose um, this right here so they can see what it is. <clears throat> so I want this to become a quiz. I click the save button. And what you will see um, now is nothing changes here. But if I go to my um, questions, if I click on a question right now, you will see what populates is answer key. So when I click the answer key button, it'll say correct answer. And it shows what it is. And then you can assign a point value. So if you may give, um, <clears throat> you know, two points, you tell the students you're looking for, you know, uh, two facts or whatever it may be, and then click done. If you are choosing a multiple choice, if I click on this one to edit it, you could say now as a multiple choice, here's the ans answer key. Or, oops, I go, it's worth one point. If I choose happy, that's the right question, then as it completes this as an auto response, if they choose anything else, it's gonna be wrong, but if they choose happy, um, it is um, gonna be correct. So again, if you're using a simple multiple choice or true and false, uh, you wanna get you know quick formative feedback, this is how you can just go in and answer that information or put in the answers to it. So again, answer key, and then choose the point value. Now, there is a way as well where you can create um, validation to responses if you're looking for further engagement, but you can do that by going to response validation. And um, by that, where you put phone number, here, let's say you put short answer question. If I click on this one and I go to response validation, I can put text and you might have um, that it doesn't contain or it does contain. And here you can play with this on what you want. There's different features you can do. You can add that, you know, that it has to have this word in it or that it doesn't have capitals in it. Um, that's not on the test, but that's just one that you guys can can play with. Uh, I'm reading a question from Deborah that says, I read somewhere 
is not to make it a quiz because it creates problems with the link. Have you heard of that? Uh, it's only problems with the link if you don't share the link properly. And most oftentimes, teachers are not sharing the link properly. Um, that is where the biggest issue comes. And I will tell you right now that students are, are extremely clever uh, and there is ways um, that they can use different tools online to get some of the answers. So if you are a teacher who, you know, is, oh, I'm going to make all of my tests in uh, Google Forms, that's great. Um, if you're, you know, smart enough to be able to know the students that are going to cheat or not, um, but know that there is always a way to cheat no matter what we're using. So uh, my recommendation is that you're not making actual tests out of this. Um, you're using Google Forms as a way to collect data and um, a great way for formative assessment, which is not, um, you know, summative tests, okay? And besides, a summative test on Google Form, just, just, I don't know, I don't think it's best teaching practice. Um, it's just not the right way to do it. You're kind of limited in, in what you can actually get the kids to do. So, uh, I mean, again, there's a ton of functionality, but um, not the best way to collect that hard data um, from the students. But again, uh, here is the Google Forms. Now, within Google Forms as well, um, there is add-ons that you can add. There is extensions. There's things like form limiters um, and all that type of stuff. So when I created a Google Form, uh, when I did my first training session, I limited it to 240 people because I wanted to use Google Meet. So at 240 people, the form closed. There's a bunch of different things that you can do. Um, but all you need to know for the test is how to create a new form, how to create questions, and... <clears throat> um, how to add videos to it, as well as um, how to analyze the data. So let's look at the data. Uh, Salt, um, great response. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, Forms has its tools. It has a, a amazing functionality, but it doesn't work for, for all practices. So um, again, there's a million ways that you can use it. You have to find what's best for you. Uh, digital escape rooms is great. Uh, you know, um, again, the possibilities are endless. Whatever you can think of, you can come up with. But forms is is a great tool. I use it all the time for collecting data uh, for everything. I'm if there's something that I need from my teachers about uh, Google or surveys or things like that, boom, push out a form and then you instantly get the data. So let's have a look at um, the data and how we analyze and assess it. So if we click the responses button, it's going to say zero responses because there's nobody that's given me any responses. Um, but what you will also see is the little icon for Google Sheets. So I'm going to leave this one, and I'm going to jump over here to this form, which is today. Uh, so the form that you guys did for me. And as you see right now, I have responses 73. So let's click on the 73 responses. I know you guys are missing me, so I thought I'd check in and say hi. <laughs> I'm still here. It's not a pre-recorded voice, but let's go back to the big screen so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, all right, so here we have 73 responses, and as you see that I did email check-ins, and as I scroll down, I'm getting all of the data in a way that I really don't like. Um, it's not organized for me. Um, it is all individual responses. So if you look at the top, it says summary. I can go by question. So for each question, I can see who said what, or I can look at individual responses. The individual responses, this is important so that um, if you're looking at uh, specific students who have taken a test, they may have, you have, may have had paragraph questions. So you wanna go through and see you know, what did they choose? How are they feeling today? And then, you know, you might read their response and say, okay, well, this is partially right, but you were missing, you know, one of the facts. So you get a two out of three, you didn't get three out of three. So it allows you to grade the assignment manually by doing this. This wasn't a test. So um, 
the information is just coming, pardon me, um, out this way. Now, one of the nice things on using the data is this right here, if we go by question. If we go to a question, and I'm going to choose, uh, there's lots of pages of responses here, but um, let me randomly, if I can, uh, I'll choose Johnson and, and see what this response is. Oh, sorry. Um, not last name. Should have done this. How are you feeling today? And I see 63 responses. So if I click on this right here, it's going to tell me everybody that chose that response. Um, but I can also go in the view options as well and, and check those and seeing who's saying overwhelmed, who's not. So if you use this as a formative assessment tool or not a, a social emotional wellness check-in, you know, you can quickly right at the beginning of your class, give the same form to your students, you know, once a week and do a check-in. And then, you know, if you see that you have 10 that are overwhelmed right now, maybe that's where you make that, you know, that connection with them here as we're going through virtual learning. Um, but this is a great way to look at the information and get the summary of those questions and, you know, use it in a way as you need to to collect the data, okay? If you go um, to the snowman, you will see that you have select response destinations. Uh, you can delete all the responses. So let's say that you're just doing this as a, a social check-in um, and or maybe a daily check-in and you're using the same form over and over and over again and you can just go in and go delete all responses um, so that you can just continually using this form again. But one of the cool things is that you see here, it says view in sheets. So if I click view in sheets, it's gonna populate a new Google sheet that is gonna give me all of the information. And I'm gonna go here, oops, come on, come on. I'm going to go right here and tell you uh, why, again, I hate when people put um, name and they don't put first name and last name. Um, whenever you're trying to sort your data, generally you sort stuff maybe by first name and last name or, uh, you know, you decide to, you know, put all the last name first. Um, and you can't do that when you create a Google form that just says name. So I highly recommend that you always um, put first name, last name. One of the nice things about a Google form is you will see that it automatically puts a timestamp. So it shows when you guys um, have completed this or when you filled in the form. So for you as a teacher, it always goes on the Google time clock. So you never have to worry about students changing their time clock on their computers and saying, oh, I submitted it at this time. Um, if you set an assignment that it needs to be completed by five o'clock, if they submit it, you can see that, you know, it's submitted within that time or if they submitted it the next day, etc. So the timestamp, uh, is always great. And the timestamp always shows up whether you make it anonymous or not, but this just allows you to go through and again, right here, be able to, uh, see the information. And if you're looking and seeing who's overwhelmed, I'm just going to go right here and do a quick sort A to Z and gives me the, okay, here's my overwhelmed people. And these are the people that I got to check in on because, you know, they just have too much on their plate right now and they need a little assistance. So Google forms, um, as we go back to it, and I know I spent a little bit of time, but it's one that a lot of you are going to use, um, especially as we start our journey into virtual learning in, in the next, um, a little bit. Okay. Whoops.
Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. All right. Whew. We're an hour and a half in, and we still got a ton of work to do. Um, hopefully, you guys are doing well. I know this, is again, is a ton of information uh, to digest. And, um, again, uh, bookmark the uh, YouTube video so you can go through it and, uh, you know, make your way through. Uh, I'll try my best uh, in the next couple of days. I got some other trainings that I have to do, but I'll take this video and I'll put um, cards along the way to break the video down. All right, as we move forward, we are going to jump into Google Sheets. And this is the one that gets everybody. So if you have a pen and paper, um, I'd highly recommend it. I'm going to have another sip of my coffee. Uh, give you a second to uh, grab a pen and paper or a piece of paper to write some of the things down um, because it's important that you know how to do a few functions for your level one test if you've never used a function before. Okay, so uh, if you haven't taken your selfie yet, um, take that selfie and post it up on Twitter. Oh, don't post this one. If you want me to smile, <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, get that selfie posted and uh, put it out there. If you ever, for those of you that are taking the level one test, you're going to take level one test, and then you're going to get so motivated that you're going to want to do level two. And then when you do level two, if you're a Googly person, you're going to want to go to Google Trainer. And I encourage you um, to become a Google Trainer because the information and what you learn about technology and the Google tools out there is insane. It's this whole new world um, that would just blow your mind. But in order to become a Google trainer uh, and to become a Google innovator, you have to have a social presence. You have to, have a, a, sorry, a social presence. They look to see, um, you know, what have you been doing online? Are you sharing with people? Um, you know, are you collaborating with people? That that's what they really want to know. So uh, it's difficult if you don't have a social presence or you don't have YouTube or you know something that you've done in the past before um, to get to especially something like the innovator status. Hopefully that's someplace you all want to go. Uh, I've been um, coaching and training and, and helping people with Google for probably about the last five years. Uh, and I'm not even remotely close to be able to apply for my innovator status just simply because um, I'm not well known enough. Uh, but uh, yeah, start creating a social presence. All right, are we ready? Google Sheets. I hate Google Sheets. Uh, it can be extremely uh, powerful, um, an awesome, awesome tool, great for sorting your data. If you are a computer science person, this is going to be easy peasy for you. If you're not, some of you will be like, please help me. Um, and I have made your life a little easier. So um, when I say making your life a little easier as I present my screen, um, here is the information that you're going to need to know for your for your uh, level one test is you're going to need to know the basics of how to create a sheet um, and rename a sheet as well as move sheets. You're going to need to know how to format a cell, uh, insert rows and columns, free rows and columns, sort columns, and then the basic functions of the sum, average, unique, counta, and count if and then uh, creating charts. And I've also given you down here a uh, help review video um, to help you through some of it, and then a Google uh, Sheets, Cheat Sheet. So this one is directly from Google. that will kind of help you through if you're struggling with the uh, functions. Um, most people just you know, use the, the basic sum function or the average function, and then that's awesome. Um, but there's a couple other ones that they're looking for. And when you get to level two, if you are taking the level two, it's not much harder. You just have to create what's called a pivot table. Um, but you, you then they're more so asking you, how can you use the Google Sheets uh, effectively um, to help you in the classroom? So you're basically you know, flopping the information. Here you're learning the tools, or you know how to use the tools. And then in level two, they're asking you, OK, you know how to use the tools. Well, how could you use these tools in your classroom to you know, to assist and make teaching better or, or to analyze the data. So let's jump into uh, this. And again, reminder that there are the task sheets and the tasks that you're going to need to know. But let's go through this um, here. So um, I created and oops, 
I jumped ahead one slide. My apologies. Uh, in the uh, Google Sheets, you will see that there is a sample uh, classroom that is set up to help you go through uh, creating and um, you know putting some of the information in there. You don't need to uh, go and open this right now. I would just more so put it in there. And the reason I put it in there is just to help you through it so that you don't have to type in a whole bunch of nonsense data. So if we look at the level one sample sheet that is in the tasks, you might see something like this. And let's just have a quick look at Google Sheets and, and what there is. Um, again, we know how to label documents. We know how to share documents. We've already gone through there. You have the basic function tools. Um, it's not you know, uh, Microsoft Excel that is super in-depth and you know, it has an, an, a ton of power, but it probably has about 80% of the capacity of, of what Microsoft Excel does, and there's no need to you know, have your students do any more. Uh, everything that you need to teach your students to a high school level and even to a university level can be done in Google Sheets. But let's have a look at some of the information that we've just collected. You know, This could be a, a Google Form. So you've created a Google Form, and in the Google Form, you've asked the students to uh, document um, their attendance. So maybe in Google Classroom every day, they have to put in an attendance sheet, uh, or maybe they just need to record their absences. And, and at the end of the year, you give them a list of here's how many absences. But let's you're using this data to, let's say, uh, find out a little bit of information about the students. So here we got a bunch of um, people that are, are put in class. Um, we've labeled them by gender. We have the attendances, and we've you know, put in what their average is for each semester. So if you don't know this, uh, and again, I'm not here to teach you on an entire uh, Google Sheets lesson because we only have about an hour and a half left, uh, but each cell, um, each one of these is called a cell. Each little bl block that you see is called a cell, and every one of those cells um, can have its own properties. And when I say properties, you can put its own function to it. You can color it its own color. Um, you can. There's a ton of things that you can do with this. Google even just came out with inserting a new image to make it a little bit user friendly. So um, this isn't on the test, but it's a, a cool little feature. I'm going to reset this. If I click here and go insert, I can insert an image into the cell itself. Uh, so it. Before, it would just put an, in, an image over top of a whole bunch, and you would have to format the image to the size. Now you can insert uh, an image into a specific cell. So if you're creating information for students and you're saying, you know, we're going to have a pizza party, choose who's your favorite pizza, and you put a picture of a pepperoni, a, you know, um, Hawaiian pizza, deluxe, et cetera, et cetera, you have that, you know, functionality that you can do that however you need to. But again, each... Um, each cell can be formatted. So you can put its own you know, borders to it if you need to. Uh, you can color each cell. You can change the font of each cell. You can change the size. So I can change this specific one to make it bigger than the others. So you have that functionality to be able to do that. If you are not aware, um, what you'll see right here is you have these, if they're going down, they're columns, up and down, obviously they're columns. A lot of people get confused by that. Students, for whatever reason, um, get confused by columns and going horizontally are rows. Um, and th so the one drawback uh, is that when you select a specific cell, it doesn't tell you what cell you're in. You actually have to look at it. So uh, unlike um, the Microsoft Excel that's going to tell you that you're in F, because we're going F right here, 20, it'll say F20 up there. Um, in Google Sheets, it doesn't tell you that. But just know that you need to be aware of what um, cell you're in in order for you to be able to um, give you um, the data that you're looking for. So let's look at uh, creating uh, a new row, or sorry, a new column. I'm just going to put my cursor over top of this one. I'm going to right click 
because you need to know how to insert rows. So I'm just going to go insert to the left or to the right. I want this one to go to the right right here. And uh, same, I'm going to go right here. I'm going to go insert, and I want to go one below. Okay. So I have this data, and what I would like to do is just go final. Final average. And we're just going to create a, a simple uh, sum and then average. And I see my colleague here, uh, Ms. Kolakar, a uh, computer science teacher. She's a genius at this stuff. She's my go-to person um, when I need Excel or I need Google Sheets or I need some computer science stuff. So, uh, you know, <laughs> she's looking at this going, I got this. This is easy. Um, but let's look at a simple fun sum feature. And when you're looking at uh, Google Sheets, in order for us to create a function, um, which is like a task, basically, we type in the equals button. So we type in equals, and I'm going to put sum. And for all the mathematicians out there, you know that sum is just adding um, you know, some numbers together. It's the sum of that. Uh, information. So I'm going to put sum, and this is important where you need to write down because you're going to get confused. You're not going to remember this. So if you're writing down some uh, formulas or some functions on a piece of paper, it's going to be equals and then sum. It's also on that cheat sheet that I gave you. And then an open bracket. And by starting the open bracket, we are selecting the range of data that we want. And in this situation, let's say that we want the sum of this. So what I did was I just clicked and dragged. And you can see it highlighted in green. And then it's saying, OK, give me the sum, the total of E16 to H16, which is right here. And obviously, we don't. the final average is not the sum of. OK? Clearly, that's not the sum of. But I'm just showing you that so that you understand what a sum is. Let's say we want to look at how many absences there was in total. I'm going to go equal sum, oops, and then open brackets. And I'm going to click and drag all of this information like that. And then press Enter and say, wow, uh, we've had 111 absences in this class throughout the school year. It's crazy. So a simple uh, sum function. But also remember that um, the sum function just works like your know, regular PEMDAS, your regular math. Um, we could, at the end of this, put uh, divide by 4 and get a 51, which is going to give us an average. So although we didn't actually put in an average function, just using a simple math formula, just some PEMDAS, um, you know, we said, okay, give me the sum of this, and we put it in brackets, and then I put divide by four uh, is going to give us an average, okay? So sum can be used for um, anything, and it's kind of the go-to for, for most people. It's the go-to for most people who don't know much about Google Sheets, and they're just trying to, to muddle their way through it. Let's say you're planning a trip to Switzerland, or you're planning, a, you know, you want to do a a trip to um, a field trip, you're proposing it, and you just need to do some you know, basic calculations um, on what costs might be. You, know, you can just create a, a simple total button. And then here, I'm going to go equals sum. Oops, I pressed the plus button. And if I press my control button, it allows me to choose which specific cells I want. So I want multiple ones. So let's say you're creating a budget and you say, I want this one, this one, this one, and that one. And then I can either close my brackets or I just press enter and it does it for me and allows you um, to be able to create a total. So again, um, that is how we are using this. So I created the average, which you need to know. So you need to know how to use the sum function, which you just have, which is equals sum, and then open brackets, and then put in your range of data. Your range of data is the cells that you choose, OK? And then press the Enter button. 
you need to know how to calculate an average. An average is really easy because you just type in, um, if you start typing in average, you're going to see that you're going to get a pop-up menu that says average. And it says average. And then you just do the exact same thing. All you do here is you go like that, select your range of data, and press enter, and boom. It says that Winnie Cooper, wow, you know, bless that child. She's amazing. Um, she got a 99.25. She's a rock star. She's awesome. Um, but I want to do the same for the rest of the students. Again, Google is extremely intuitive. If I've created the formula right here, all I do is I press the control C button and I'm going to go to the next cell right below it. And I press the paste button control V and it automatically uh, recognizes that I have pasted that function into another cell, but I'm actually looking for this data and you'll see that it shows E3 through H3. So it's giving me this row again, another cool feature is I'm just gonna select all of these right here and then go paste and it pastes all of it. And I wanna do the exact same thing. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go and find out what is the average of the class. So I'm gonna go to average. I'm gonna select this data right here and say my class average is 75. So you need to know the sum function and you need to know the average function. Now I saw that um, we had a question, how do you use the unique function? Um, it's one of those functions that you need to do. They're gonna give you a simple example just like this. And uh, we are going to use equals and then start typing in unique. And unique uh, looks up just unique values within the chart. So I'm gonna click unique and you'll see that I've specifically highlighted and uh, formatted two boxes for you right here because it's gonna look for those two changes in the data and I'm gonna select gender in this situation and then press enter. And it's gonna tell you that your common values in row C are male and female, okay? So it's just looking for uh, the differences between the two. You're going to get a very simple task. So if you're asking how to use unique, this is about the extent of what you need to know unique for. Got it? All right. Class size. Class size, um, many of you might look at it and say, okay, uh, it's not hard for me to... Um, not hard for me to look at this chart and say, okay, well, there's a title right here and I see 16. So obviously there's not 16, there's only 15 students in there. Um, so what do I do here? That's fine, you, it's easy to figure out that you have 15 students, but what if you have a, a list that has, you know, you're doing a, um, a sheet for the entire school and you got a thousand students or 2,500 students in there, and you need to get that exact number and they've all completed this. Well, you can use the counta function by pressing equals and go counta. And again, that's gonna count all the values in a data set on the range of information that you give. So if I just choose this right here, and say, okay, well, I've counted that, it's told me that the total is 15. And that's because I selected this information. Again, um, it seems very simple right now because you're like, well, I know that it's 15 because it's, it's an easy chart to look at, but this is important if you have a range of data that might have two or 300 people in there and you don't want to sit there and, and maybe you have, you know, you're trying to look at it and you just want that, figure that out. The counter doesn't necessarily have to be um, just an up and down uh, row or horizontal column or sorry, a, a column of data or a, a row of data. I could go back here and I'm just gonna remove that and say that I'm gonna select all of these and say, okay, just give me the total for all that. And it says, I now have, you know, total 90, um, you know, points of data that I can assess with. 
So that is using your uh, count to function. Again, it's basically what you're doing. So if you're asking, um, you know, I really want to dig in deep to it, check the cheat sheet um, because we could spend hours and hours and hours going through uh, Google Sheets and you don't need to know. You just need to know some basic stuff. The last one that you need to know is the uh, count if function. And that is typing in count, and you will see that you have one that says count if, okay? And basically, if you're count if, you're looking at a uh, if statement, which is kind of like a true or false. So I'm going to say count if, and I'm going to select this data range right here. And this is important. So for those of you that got up and grabbed a piece of paper um, or are going to uh, mark, mark this down at one hour and 51 minutes in the time counter, uh, you need to put a comma and then a space. And then I'm going to put an open parentheses. And I'm going to type exactly what I'm looking for, an F, close parentheses, and then a close bracket. And you will see that for females, what I've asked the count if is I said, if there's three, or if you see an F, give me a value, okay? Or so give me a, a true statement and then count the numbers. So this allows me to, if you're looking, let's say you, you know, you're a register in the school and you have a, a whole bunch of data and you export and you have male or female, you could type in count if and tell me how many female students there are and boom, there's your number. Or if you're looking for, you know, in the grade level, you say count if and then say, you know, put a, a number nine. It's, it's a way for you just to analyze and quickly pull data from that. So you need to know the sum, the average, the counter, and the unique code and the count if, okay? Again, it's in the tasks and it's in that little cheat sheet to help you. The last thing that you need to do uh, before we jump to creating charts is protecting your ranges and your data and freezing them. So almost all of us make uh, headers. So we put the information at the top of what we're looking for. And if you select that first row, you can see when I go to view, I've selected the first row of data right here. And I'm going to go view and then say freeze. And I'm going to say row one. So what happens now is no matter what I do, if I'm scrolling up and down right now like this, you can see as I scroll, the top row doesn't move. Okay, And that is by, again, going to selecting that row and going view and freeze. So you're going to have to freeze uh, a row uh, within the document that you ask uh, to do that. Okay. Um, the last thing is protecting columns. And in order to protect a column, it's pretty simple. When you um, go through your information, or sorry, when you are looking at your data, when you put your cursor over top of the letters, you will see that I get a little arrow that pops up right beside and I can click on that and right at the bottom go protect range. So let's say I don't want anybody to be able to edit this one or change this one. Uh, and I'll give you an example of, of how this uh, can be used. Um, so you can set the permissions to only you or to somebody else. But an example being in my school, we had what was called a, um, I think of the name right now. Um, it's kind of like a club. I'll call them club. Uh, an enrichment class. We had an enrichment class. And it wasn't an actual class that was put into our portal where we could keep track of attendance because the kids rotated every quarter. So we created a Google Sheet. Um, and in that, we would just go into it and add an A or, or P for their present. But what was happening was right at the start when our counseling team created it was that people were going through and, and messing up and all the data would just keep disappearing because people didn't know how to use Google Sheets properly. 
So we finally showed the counselors just go in and protect each sheet. So if we finished enrichment on Tuesday um, and we don't have enrichment till next Tuesday, just protect last Tuesday's row or column and then add a new one so that people can only edit that one row. Uh, and they were like, oh, okay, well that works great then. So here you're just using protect range. And again, you are just simply setting permissions where you can just say final average. And here you're saying a range. Oops, I typed final row. Here you're saying a range, which is this data right here, or you can protect the entire sheet. And if you notice this says sheet one, and that refers to right here, that means this entire sheet, so nobody can touch it. We don't want this entire sheet. We just want to select the range. You can put set permissions. And right now, um, you can have it so that who can edit this, either nobody, or you can select specific people and share it so that only those specific people can edit those. Okay, so you will need to know how to um, protect a sheet and protect a range, okay? And then lastly, as we move on, um, all you need to do to create a new sheet, oops, sorry, we have two things, is press the plus button. Press the plus button and you're gonna get a new sheet that is, works within your workbook here. So here we have sheet one, and I'm just gonna right click on it and rename it. Student. Ooh. Student averages. And I'm gonna right click on it, and I wanna change the color to green so I can recognize it. So you see the little green at the bottom. And I'm gonna rename this one and call this chart. And let's create a simple chart. So creating a simple chart, is um, just choosing the information that you want. So again, this might um, run by you pretty quickly, but you need to press the control feature or your, if you're using a Mac, your Apple uh, button. But I wanna just choose the last names. So I'm gonna press the control button down because I wanna select multiple ranges of data. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna choose the last name for uh, the students. I want the attendance, and then I want the final average right here. So I selected these three uh, ranges of data, and I'm gonna go to insert and go to chart. There we go. It just took a little bit for it to pop up. So now you see that I have this uh, chart pop up and it's sitting here on this sheet and it's sitting right over top of all the data. And you see here that it just basically shows absences to date and final grade. So it's giving you your basic legend. Here it's telling me that Brady, you can see that um, you know his grade and the amount of absences that he has, dynamite, blah, 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 blah. And then we can edit this as well by clicking on the snowman button. So if we, or not, sorry, the snowman button, uh, if you look over here, this data will um, show up. And really all you're doing in the test uh, is creating a very simple chart like this. So you select the range of data, and then the last thing that you need to do is you need to move this to a separate sheet. And to do that, you just simply select the snowman and go to make to own sheet or move to own sheet. So if I go move to own sheet, it's going to take this and post it into chart one and you'll see right here. Now again, um, we have this chart right here. We can protect this chart. We can edit the chart. Uh, you can go through this and say, I want to 
you know, show a little more information. I want to customize this. I want to change the chart style. Um, they don't ask that specifically. They just ask you to make a chart with selected data, which is very similar to this. Okay. So if you can go into a Google sheet that looks like this and you can um, create the formulas or the functions and then extract the data and put the student's name in there and make a very basic chart that looks like this, you will be just fine. Again, in the slide deck, I've given you right here some cheat sheets. I've given you a review um, link to a video that'll help you through this if you forget, and as well the tasks. So you don't have to watch the whole video, okay? All right, let's cruise on. We got the next one. And the next one is Google Classroom. Now, I can spend hours and hours and hours talking about Google Classroom, but I need to talk about what you basically need to do. And if you are brand new to Google Classroom, I apologize. I'm going to go rel through this relatively quickly because uh, I have to assume that most of the people that are in here have used Google Classroom. And again, as we go through this, this isn't a, a full-on how to use every single tool properly. This is what do you you need to know in order to be successful in the test, okay? So in the test, I'm gonna present uh, my screen so it's big for you guys. You will see that you need to set up a classroom, add your students with email and a code, customize your classroom, create an assignment, organize, organize, organize. You need to be able to add links and videos and uh, you need to be able to view the assignments and then use the mobile uh, app. I'm adding that in as well. And <clears throat> grading assignments in the feedback and comment tool, okay? So I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. Again, uh, we're not gonna go through an entire Google Classroom because that could be uh, upwards of like a two hour lesson itself. So let me close out this data for the forms. We don't need that one anymore. And let's go and, if you remember, I'm gonna just type in classroom and it's gonna take me to Google Classroom. So when I type in Google Classroom, it's gonna take me to my main teaching page. If you've never used Google Classroom before, when you sign in, it's gonna ask you whether you're a student or a teacher. Make sure you say teacher. If you say student by accident, your IT department is gonna hate you um, because it's it's not an easy fix. There's a lot of steps that they gotta go through to make sure in the back end that they put you in the right groups again. So uh, if you're ever just logging into Google Classroom or you're moving to a new school or district, make sure you choose teacher. Okay, so this is gonna be your Google Classroom dashboard. This is where your classrooms show up. Um, you can adjust your classrooms by just dragging them around. I always organize my classrooms as per my schedule. So uh, period one, period two, period three, period four, period five, I like to see them that way. Um, so we wanna create a new classroom. And to create a new classroom, again, look at your dashboard, which is your online screen. You have your username, you have your waffle, uh, you have the plus button and then you have the hamburger over here. <clears throat> I'll talk about the hamburger in a second, but we want to create a new class. So all we're going to do is click the plus button and you will see that you either join class or create class. So you as a teacher creating a new class, um, you can also join classes. So I was working on some Edpuzzle uh, training and Edpuzzle said, hey, here's the tutorial. It's on Google Classroom. Um, we want you to join this class in Google Classroom. So if you are joining outside, you can also join uh, classes from outside your domain, depending on the user that you have. Don't do it with your school account, okay? Because they won't let you uh, join up. But you're creating a class, so we click Create Class. You put in the class name, Google Certified Educator, Level 1, D2, oops. And your section, maybe your, uh, this is, uh, you teach the same class four times, so maybe this is the one section of it. The subject could be tech, and your room 
is, oops, just whatever, and click Create. Now, it takes a little while for you to create classes uh, because, again, it's got to go to the Google server, and it has to propagate and then send it back. So the Google Classroom, is it, it takes a little bit to set up. So as you see here, and it's creating, 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 it's not because it is um, my internet, which for whatever reason is a little bit slow today, but again, it's the Google Classroom and it has to set up. There's a bunch of stuff that it has to do on the back end, so it takes a little bit of time. Like, what did you see? About a minute. But some teachers get frustrated by that. Don't go uh, mouse click crazy going, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, or don't be pressing the refresh button. Just once you press submit, just let it go and away you go. Okay, um, here you'll see it's because it's the first time I'm logging in. Um, it says next because it's going to give me uh, some basic you know, tutorials. Away we go here. Cindy, I'm seeing you saying, my school uses Schoology and Seesaw. Will I run into problems doing uh, the task during the test? No, um, you shouldn't, uh, as long as you can do what I'm doing here. Um, send me uh, an email, Cindy, and I'll, uh, when I get a chance uh, in the next few days, I'll, I'll send you a couple tutorials to help you through with um, Google Classroom, OK? Um, all right, so I've created a classroom, and you see here right now it defaults the theme. Uh, you'll also see that it says generate uh, a meet link, and um, right now I know many of you might have questions about this, and I'm not going to talk about them because Google Meet is not uh, on your test um, in either platform, Criterion or Web Assessor. Okay, so if you look at the slide uh, that I show you coming up, um, we have a specific quote from Megan who just did it, and she's like, nope, it's not there. Don't worry about it, okay? But one thing that is important is the class code. So uh, your class code is how people join. So if someone was to say, hey, I want you to join my class, um, you click this little button right here that says class code, which is the enlarge button, or if you want to make it full screen, uh, this is what you do. When I have students walk into my class, they already know Google Classroom, so the first day that they walk in after I've done my procedures, I have a little conversation with them, boom, my class code is up there. They know instantly that they're going to join my class, okay? So that's one way to get your students to join your class is by adding or sharing the class code with them. And again, you could do this in, in multiple ways, uh, whether you send it out in an email or whatever it may be. The easiest thing I find is just throw it up on your whatever you're using or write it on your whiteboard or hand out pieces of paper, however you're doing it, uh, but just share the code with them. Um, what you will see here in Google Classroom, and this is important, again, you have that hamburger, you have the stream, you have classwork, you have people, and you have grades, okay? So your stream is um, where you should post announcements and only post important announcements. So. It, the stream shouldn't be used uh, for everything because if it's used for everything, then your students are, are it's going to become a norm for them to not look at it. It's like their Gmail inbox. Every assignment gets issued to their inbox, so they never look at their inbox because there's 4,000 emails in it. So if you share everything to the stream, they're not going to look at it and they're going to miss the announcements that you want them to see. I only use the stream for just announcements. So if it is like, hey, this is a reminder, then they know that it's been populated on the stream, okay? And you also have to remember that the stream doesn't go to their Gmail. Assignments, questions, quizzes, uh, those all go get, get sent to the email. The stream doesn't get sent to their email. So it's something that often gets missed, okay? But I'll show you in a second. But this is the stream, and if you want to post something to the stream, you just simply click and say, hello, welcome to a class. That's what it's going to be. Um, very quickly, you can choose which classes you want to send it to. So if this is a general announcement, Again, you have this ability to say, I don't want to type this message three times. I just want it to go to every class. Boom. 
here's an announcement that's saying, hey, we got a field trip tomorrow. Don't forget to bring your, um, you know, your proper, we have a dress code at our school when we go on field trips. So make sure you're in your formals tomorrow. Um, so boom, I put that in there. If I want to add anything, same as you are doing in any of your other productivity tools, you click the add button, it's gonna allow you to pull a file, a PDF, a picture, um, anything you have within your Google Drive. If you have your own like MOV movie, if you have a Screencastify video that you wanna share or announcement, you can pull all of those. If you have a URL, you can add a link. If you have a file, you can attach again any type of file. You got a PDF or you're working on something specific. Maybe you're in math class and you're you know, using a math program and you want them to open it up on in a certain program, you could say, hey, here's this file. And as well, you can embed a YouTube video just like you did uh, in Google Forms that we talked about. If you don't wanna send this to every class, you could go, here's the one class that I want, and then you will notice that it opens uh, the, or it grays the tab for students. So I can choose all students, or I can choose uh, one student. So Sunil joined this class, awesome. So if I chose um, you know, the one student, basically what this is set up for is uh, for differentiation for remedial work. Um, you know, Maybe you have a student who's struggling and you wanna post something to Google Classroom, so it's there that it, it you know, it's static, it's evidence that you're supporting the student. Well, I can just say, hey, Sunil, here's this YouTube video that I want you to, to watch um, uh, to help support your, you know, the struggles that you're having in math. And again, that's only gonna go to that one student. So it's a really powerful tool to use it that way. Uh, but again, the stream is something that, um, you need to moderate and you need to set norms with your class, okay? Uh, or else, again, it's one of those that it just it gets away from you and then it becomes basically a mute point. So what you see right now in the streams and I'm showing you, this is gonna be the same as classwork. And I love reading uh, Larry's that I've learned very painfully. Um, again, if you're new to it, um, you know, it's it's, gonna have its growing pains and you're gonna figure out like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Um, until you get that. But again, just post announcements in there. So we've posted this, uh, I'm gonna choose all students and you can cancel it if you wanna get rid of it. And then you'll see that it says post or a drop down menu that will allow you to schedule it, which is awesome, or save it as a draft. Schedule, if I wanna schedule this, I can, press the schedule and say, okay, I am not starting school. Oops. Look, it said it's scheduled for tomorrow at 8 a.m. Um, cancel my saved announcements here. I'm gonna click on this one and it says tomorrow at 8 a.m. I'm gonna change that. So you're gonna say school is gonna start, I don't know when school starts for you guys, for me, um, maybe August uh, 26th at 8 a.m. for my first class, boom, um, and go schedule. So now I know on that first day of school, that's gonna pop up and I'm ready to go that day. So it's automatically gonna populate, okay? Again, if you just wanna push it out automatically, you can remove that and then just go post and it's gonna post it to the student stream immediately. So Sunil will be able to see this um, instantly, okay? Same as in your um, Google Forms, you can go to select the theme and you can change the theme. So it may ask you to change a theme within your classroom, whether you're math or science. Uh, what I love doing with my students is I get them all together and I jam pack them into a specific little size. I take a class photo and then I put all their pictures up there uh, so they see them. This year, my intention, depending on um, who I'm teaching, uh, is get them to create avatars and then just create a little avatar world so it becomes their world in there. So you can do that by, um, if I don't wanna change the theme, I can just go to upload photo and I could add any photo that's in there um, that I want. Again, you're just creating it and making it fun for the students, okay? So 
that is uh, this information right here. You'll see classwork. And classwork is where you start posting your assignments, your um, questions, and anything like that. So if you look on there, it's going to ask you to create an assignment, add links, videos, and drives. So when you click the plus button, you are going to create an assignment, a quiz, a question, material, or repost, and a topic. If you look, if you're looking at the uh, slide deck right now, that that is the basically the agenda or what you need to know for this. I keep saying organize, 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 and because if you're a Google school, it means that you're probably using Google this year. You're probably going to be teaching the same class, hopefully the same class next year, and you're going to want to reuse content. And you can't just copy a, a Google class and duplicate it and go and you know use it the next year. But you can reuse material. So when you start setting up your Google Classroom at the beginning, it's really important to make sure that you're organized and that you organize it the right way. You're going to start off with Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3, Unit 4, so on and so forth. So my recommendation for you is before you start posting things, start putting a topic in there. If your topic is going to be, um, let's say, procedures for your class, that's how you're starting off your year. You create procedures, and maybe within that you have, you know, your procedures is, okay, I got a... Uh, a checklist that I want them to go home. I need a, a student, a parent information sheet completed. I have this, I have that, and so on. So I've created a topic of procedures. And then from there, let's say you start creating an assignment. Your assignment could be um, procedures. Uh, I'm going to go right here, number one, and I'm going to call this 1.1 1 .1 and say, um, Tell me about you. Maybe you got a Google Doc that's already set up, and it's all about you. And um, that is, tell me about you. Okay. And then in the instructions, it says, please uh, read the info on the Google Doc. Blah 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 blah. Okay. And I'm going to. Add, I can go into my Google Drive, and I'm going to pretend that I'm giving you a Google Doc. Again, this right here is an Omnibox, so it'll search anything in your Google Drive. So if you can't remember, if you can't remember where you placed it, I'm going to say, I'm going to attach this file right here and go insert. This is important to note. Uh, it's not on the test, but um, students can view file. What that basically means is that everybody is viewing your owned file. Your The file that you own, they can have view rights. They're just looking at it, OK? You can have students can edit file. <laughs> Careful. Um, I know many of teachers who have checked this off on a Google Doc, and all of a sudden, um, you know, you have 20 students that are all trying to edit the same doc, and it just becomes a, a, a mumble jumble of information, and all of a sudden, it's not what you want. Uh, I would say this works well if you are giving a Google slide deck and you assign each student a slide and say, you know, create a slide and tell me about yourself. And uh, Johnny, you're assigned slide two. Uh, Pete, you're assigned slide three, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but use the edit very carefully. Make your own copy means that each student is going to get their own individual copy that they can work on and then you submit back. Most of the stuff that I do is going to be make your own copy. So it automatically puts the student's name at the beginning of the title and then they get a copy that they get to work on. So I'm going to say make a copy for each student. And uh, if I wanted to, I could go in here and say, you know what, I haven't created a, an assignment for this yet, so this is just another way for you to create a doc so I can start working on a Google Doc or a sheet or a form and just plug it in from right here as you are creating it. You'll see here that you can assign it to your multiple classes, same as you did in the stream. And here, if we want to go to individual students, so if I had uh, multiple students in this class, I could choose just one or two students. Point value, if you are grading this, um, so you could say it's ungraded, or you could say 
you know, so the students want to know what the value is. And you assign a due date. And this is phenomenal uh, because it shows you if the assignment is turned in on time or not. If I say that it's due Friday, if you just put Friday, it's going to be 11.59 p.m. But you could say that I want this done by class on Friday and our class ends at 2.45. I could say 2.45 p.m. And again, where it said topic, I'm going to put it under procedures. Now, there's a really cool feature in here that we're, we're not going to get to, and it's not on the test. Um, but you can create rubrics and use rubrics with inside Google Docs uh, or Google Assignments. And the plagiarism is originality reports, which means now what you can do, just like turnitin.com, if you check this off, uh, you'll see here that students um, can run originality report, and what it'll do is it'll check the percentage of, of copied content and then give them saying, like, listen, 10% of this has been uh, copied work or has been sourced from the internet. And you as a teacher get to see those reports. So the students get to run three originality reports before they submit it. It's awesome. Great for English teachers. Uh, great for my... Um, uh, ESL students, my English is a second language here in Kuwait. They love to copy paste Wikipedia and change a couple words. Uh, so <laughs> now they just, they, they, they're like, oh, this sucks uh, because Mr. M's always running originality reports. Originally, rally group, uh, the originality reports were beta last year, but now they've pushed it out live for um, the schools. So I can uh, check originality reports and then I'll get that. And then again, up here in this button, I can go assign or I can schedule it, or if I'm not sure that I want to push this out, I can save a draft. So if I click the Assign button, here we go. So it goes under, again, it takes a minute because it's got to populate. There's a bunch of stuff it's got to do. It's got to create in the Classroom folder and all this stuff, but it takes a second for it to populate. Now, you notice that it said Procedures 1.1. Um, I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to rename this and just call this 1 for my own uh, purposes and rename it and go, there we go. So it says one procedures. The reason why I want to start doing this or why you should start doing this is because if you go back to create an assignment and you go reuse post, most of the stuff that we do as teachers, we're creatures of habit. So we just use the same things in sequential order again. Uh, maybe we change things up a little bit. But if you go back to reuse post, what it allows you to do is it allows you to go back to any of your classes that you've had. And if you're doing biology from last year, maybe you got unit one. And then if you label your assignments as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you don't have to hunt for them anymore. Now you literally just have to go to your topic and say, okay, there's 1.11, there's 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15. .1 and then just literally select this if I wanted to say this and you see that this one isn't labeled properly so I would be hunting for it because this list would be just full it would, like the whole thing would be filled up with assignments and then I just go reuse and what it does is it takes your text that you written it takes the assignment that you created the information that you put in there and all of it just gets created and you're ready to go again so you could just take something from Last semester's class and whoop, automatically do it again. And that's all about making sure that you're organized, okay? So for Google Classroom, you've created a classroom, you've created assignments. I'm gonna close this. Um, creating a quiz, again, as soon as you go quiz assignment, it's basically creating a Google form. It's gonna allow you to create a Google form and then it's gonna ask you to do the exact same thing where it says go into your quizzes feature and, and go from there. A question. Phenomenal uh, formative assessment tool. <laughs> I always use a question at the beginning of my class to say, tell me what we learned yesterday. That's that's my kind of go-to one. Okay, tell me what you learned yesterday. And uh, it's my two minutes or three minutes at the beginning of the class that one, they have, I always set a time to it. So if class starts at eight o'clock, it has to be done by like 8.04 uh, or 8.05. And that gives me five minutes that boom, they're reflecting on what they did yesterday. Um, maybe I check it all the time, maybe I don't. Uh, but they're doing it, and then it allows me five minutes to do my attendance and get ready if I, you know, 
had something come up or had to respond to a staff email or whatever it may be. But questions are that great formative assessment tool. The material is where you would post uh, static information. So maybe you got uh, your syllabus, your class procedures, your rules, your um, you know lab safety, da 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 da. Put that into a materials folder so it's stuff that the students know that they can always go back to. It's not something that they have to hunt for. It's just it's in material. They know that it, it's just this. It's there. Okay. Um, so that is basically creating. If you want to add people, you can do the busy work and you can add students and you can add co-teachers by going to people and just simply right here in the plus button, I can go invite. So um, I'm looking right now, I'm using a different account. So it, none of your uh, emails are gonna show up, but if I wanted to just type in my other account, I could type in this one and go invite, and that is going to send an email to me saying, would you like to join the class? So you can see that I'm invited here. So you could be the, the what I want to say, uh, organized teacher and go and you get your student lists and, you know, you create and you join every um, student so that when they walk into class, they're like, hey, how are you? Uh, I teach middle school, high school, and that never happens. I get kids coming in and out in the first week because they change my class or, you know, whatever it may be. So I never invite kids. I just show them the class code all the time. If you uh, work as uh, with teaching partners, you can add a teacher as well. And then a teacher has rights to uh, basically be a moderator of your class. It gives them permission to add assignments, to remove assignments, to grade assignments, and do all of that stuff. OK, so you're only limited to uh, 20 teachers, which that's excessive. But some people are like, oh, well, we're going to add every teacher in the building. You can't do that. Google Classroom's not set up for that. OK, but this is how you can just simply add teachers and add students. Again, if you are uh, in your school domain, as soon as you type a student's name, because they already have a Gmail account, uh, their name is going to populate. If you want to get rid of a student, you just click their name and where it says actions, you can see that it says remove. If you want to personally email a student, there you go. Um, you can email it. Again, this is one of those that um, I teach middle school and high school. And when I email a student this way, they never check their email. They never get it because they have 4,000 emails in their inbox. So again, it, it, it's an easy way for you to uh, email the students, but at the same time, uh, it's a tool if you want to use it. Uh, it's not necessary. Uh, I, it's not, I don't believe that it's specifically on the test, but this is how you can remove a student by selecting them. Or if um, I wanted to send an email, I can just go email. Or as you see right here, I have a student who is that painful student who always wants to comment in the chats and they just always have something to say. I can mute that student so they never pop up. So Larry, um, this could be a tool for you if you have a couple of those students that are just taking over your stream, okay? Um, what you will see as well, When you um, click on a student's name, it's going to show you uh, what they've turned in, what's missing, and what's been uh, returned, etc. So again, this isn't on the test. You just have to set up those basic things on what I showed you. Um, if you're going into your class, you can set up your grades with your weighting. And this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it's not anything that you... Uh, yeah, you have to set up within your class. I would say that if you're going to take the Google test um, within a year, you're probably going to have to know more about grading. Um, but uh, right now, you just have to set up the, the basic functions on setting up the you know a class and an assignment, uh, and that you don't need to uh, set up your class and focus on the grades. Why? Because not every school is using an SIS, a student information system. 
Google is connected, Google Classroom is connected to some SIS systems, but not all of them. So grading right now is, is still a little, um, it, it's not specific or it's not uh, test worthy right now. The settings button is where you can go in and Larry, um, you're gonna like this one again. If you look at the stream, uh, you will see that you have your class code right here. Okay, you can display it, you can disable it so that nobody sees it. Your stream, uh, you want only teachers can comment or post, okay? <laughs> That's all I let my, uh, there is no students that comment on my streams ever, it's just me. Um, again, uh, classwork on the stream, do you want that? I don't ever want my classwork to show on the stream because I want my stream clean. So I hide the notifications and it's just the uh, information that shows up for me, okay? And then Guardian Summaries. Uh, if you don't know what Guardian Summaries are, uh, I'm turning this on for you right now and go add class. Uh, you can, if we now go back to the students, if I click the save button, we can now go back to write the Guardians so in here, in here, um, and oftentimes this is done. I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, in our system, when students register at our school, their um, parents' emails are generated into our uh, school system. So the moment a student is added, um, to my Google Classroom, their parents' email is automatically added in there. But you can uh, just simply add a, a guardian uh, by inviting them. And let me have a look uh, at an assignment. So there's one thing that I personally hate about uh, Google Classroom. And that is, as a teacher, the teacher view and the student view are different. And you need to be aware of this. When you click on the classwork page as a teacher, when you click on this assignment and go view assignment, it automatically opens up um, this window and it shows you uh, who's submitted and who hasn't. And I don't like this. And this is important for you guys to know, Google listens, and when I say they listen, they listen. So you'll see right down here, there's a little help button. If there's something that you don't like about Google or if there's something that you think should be added, you press this button and you go report an issue or request a feature. The Google staff reads every single one of these responses. So all the changes to Google Classroom, they all come from teachers. They don't come from Google staff. And that is because people make requests. So I've made this request probably a hundred times and they don't, <laughs> they don't listen to me. Maybe they don't like me, um, but maybe it needs to be 101 requests. But for me as a teacher, whenever I populate this, I chose up on my whiteboard and I wish it would show the instructions first. It wouldn't show who's turned it in and who's not turned it in. But for you as teachers, as you start grading these assignments, um, all you need to do to grade an assignment is just simply click on the student's name and it's going to show their work. And if I click on the work right here, it's going to open it up. Now I attached a Google drawing and it's going to load the document um, right here. So it's going to show me what that picture is. Okay. And in here it allows you to be able to grade it and send a private comment to a student. So here I could say, um, Sunil, you did a great job. Uh, you got a nine out of 10. And here I could just say, uh, left side lights should ace presenter. Oops. And then I'm going to post that. So that message is going to go directly back to the student. 
Um, and if you, it is a Google document, you can add a comment to the Google Doc just like you did it in the first session, in the first series, OK? Um, you'll also see that you have right here uh, a comment bank. And the comment bank is you can start creating uh, generic comments. So you can, in your comment bank, start typing in comments, and then they'll all show up right here. So if I put this one, I could go, at, uh, here's a comment, and I'll, again, just do one of these. And you can't drag and drop these comments, but what you can do is you can select this comment and then go back here and then just go paste. So if you're an English teacher and you're like, you need to, you know, you come up with a generic wordy comment, it just saves you some time, okay? And then I just post that. And here you'll see that it's returned or not returned. I've marked it so I can press the return button and say, all right, boom. And then that student uh, will get automatically their grade and it'll show that it has been returned to them. Okay. Um, on the test, we have to create samples of student work or will they already have populated in the session? No, in the test, they're gonna say create a class and then add these assignments and add this YouTube video and uh, possibly mark Sarah's uh, assignment is, is what it has. So all the information will already be in the source files. They'll already give you everything, okay? And I'm looking at the time, and um, I know that uh, time is very valuable to uh, many people, so I apologize. Uh, what we gotta get through, um, we may run a little later, so uh, for that, I apologize that I'm taking your time. If you can stick around, uh, please do. So we're moving on to Google Sites. And Google Sites um, is really straightforward. Um, really, really straightforward. I'm gonna close my Google Classroom. I'm gonna close this one. And again, with Google Sites, same as we've done with everything else, I'm gonna go sites.google.com. And it's gonna take me to my Google Sites. And in Google site, I'm not gonna spend uh, a ton of time for it because um, it really is um, pretty simple on what they're asking you to do uh, on the test. It says create a site, name the site, um, add a background, and then site navigation, move some images and resize. Um, Becky's saying we had many parents join our classrooms with their own emails. Uh, so instead of having 20 students, we had 40. Um, when it says, so because, and this is my fault, I apologize. Um, you guys can say that I'm a, I'm a bad trainer right now. Um, it's because I had to set up a, a new domain and I had to go into the Google admin and I didn't check off one of the, the check boxes in Google Classroom. So as a when a student is signed up into your domain you should just have an add button that says add parent mine didn't show up because in the admin settings i didn't have that that setting checked off but it should just say add parent you don't want a parent to ever join that class um and there's a reason for that so becky your um question right there raises a good point but it's not based on the test, but you don't ever want a parent in your class. The reason why Google gave the uh, guardian view is because they only give a snippet of the information so that the student, the students are accountable for their work, that they're being responsible. The, student, the parents are aware of what's coming or what might be missed, but you don't want the parents to have access to your Google Classroom. If the parents have access to your Google Classroom, you're taking all responsibility away from the students because they know that, and then you got that, um, you know, the helicopter parents who are, you know, coming home and saying, hey, I saw your Google Classroom on my phone today, and I know you got this science project that's due, when are you gonna get started? Um, that's not how, you know, kids should be learning in school. We need to have that accountability. So parents should never be allowed to join a Google Classroom specifically. If they do, kick them out and have that conversation with them and say, you can have the guardian view, but you can't ever have uh, access to our Google Classroom, okay? And again, you wanna protect the safety and uh, the privacy of the other students as well. All right, so uh, thanks for bringing that up, Becky. Um, but uh, yeah, 
you'll see it in Google Classroom when you guys log in with your school domain. And you'll see it um, if they ask you in the test because it's going to be prompted that way. Okay, you've heard it. You'll be looking for it. You'll be just fine. Okay, um, so Google Sites. Let's have a quick look at Google Sites. And uh, we open up Google Sites. And if we want to create um, a new site, we can just go blank. Or you can see that they've provided templates for you as well. Same as we talked with Google Slides, you can download um, already templated Google Sites, you can you can pay. Somebody, there's a ton of people that are creating basic Google Sites for you that you can buy their template for like 10 bucks and then import it. Uh, so you can do that as well. But let's just say we're gonna create a, a basic site right here, which is called a class. And again, as it, it takes a little bit to prompt this this new site, because it's got to do some stuff on the back end. A lot of people complain, as we talked about yesterday, there's no functionality in Google. And again, as I said, there's a purpose for that. It's about sharing the content. There's a lot you can do with it, but you guys don't need to know that for the level one test. For the level one test, you literally need to name the site. And to do that, you can go up here and just simply call this Mr. M's tech class. All right, so there's Mr. M's tech class. So if you were to, um, the site's not published, so you can't see it. But there is how you name uh, the website. So here we have class name. Um, this is basically just the title page. So if you called this welcome page, just like that, it's going to be your home page. And as you've all navigated through websites before, you know that you always have a home page or a landing page. And if we look at the navigation, you don't need to be um, Ms. Kolokar in here where you know she's a, a programming genius um, and can make a website you know, like that. You don't have to have the navigation skills. It's really simple. And you don't need to be afraid and go, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna do well on this, okay? But what you'll see here is a, a basic layout. You have your class name again, which is you can just, copy this. This gives you what the URL is going to be. And this is just basically for your purposes on naming that page. If you want to change the image right here, you can just go change image. You can upload your own image or you can select an image. If you upload an image, remember that there's a pixel size to it. Um, that if you are creating your own, otherwise, you're going to have to adjust it and crop it, and it's not going to you know, specifically fit perfectly. But um, again, you can create your own size. If you want the exact pixel size, just do a quick Google search for Google Sites, header, picture, pixel size, and you're good to go. Um, if you want the header type, you can adjust the header type. As it's asking you here, you can go to just the title which that doesn't look very good. You can go to banner, which is smaller, or you can go to large banner, um, or you can have a big cover. Uh, default with most people is probably gonna be the large banner, or if they don't want as much space, they're gonna use this small banner size right here, okay? You'll see here that you have this button. You don't need to know, but um, it gives you readability, so it does some artificial intelligence if you add your own picture to make it work properly, okay? Um, so here you can change uh, this right here. And again, Google is so, so, so easy to use. Um, you're literally dragging and dropping. So if you want a specific layout, you can just drag a layout right here and say, okay, that's what I want. I'm gonna put a picture here and then I'm gonna put the content. And it's already given you these specific colors. And if you don't like these colors, you can choose a theme, same as you did in Google Slides and say, okay, well, I want this one right here. So I'm gonna choose level with the blue. So I'm gonna change the font and now I'm going to blue, okay? 
And if I want to add a picture, again, I just here, I click on this. I can add a YouTube video right there. Wow, that was easy. Uh, if I want to select an image or if I want to upload an image, I can, again, if you're doing this with the students, this is a great way for you to make portfolios. I know the social studies teacher, middle school social studies and our teacher, she has the kids, uh, they start a unit on like ancient Greece or whatever it may be. And she has the kids just make Google sites. They spend one class creating a, a, a front page for a Google site and then all the work and all the assignments they put into, they put it all on that one site. So the, the students end up having this grade seven portfolio site and then she just removes them all at the end of the year so the kids just don't keep sharing those, okay? Um, but again, if you have kids use the Google image search, you never have to worry about them stealing images or copyright images. Um, you're gonna you, you're gonna get images that populate that are um, with no restrictions and can be modified and used. So here we put a puppy in there. If you need to resize the image, again, you can just simply resize the image like that. Oops. You can drag your text box and you see that um, Google makes it really easy and gives you uh, some lines um, so that you can you know, align things so that things look nice and neat and clean. And again, just put in some basic text and if you want to change this so it has the same color, you can do it so it looks like that. If you want to add a YouTube video in, which is something that you're going to need to do, you can just scroll down right here and say YouTube. All right, I'm going to grab YouTube and click on YouTube. Oops. Let's uh, you. All right, here's yesterday's um, boot camp. Click select. And again, one of the nice things about it is that it's not showing up with all the extra YouTube stuff on there. If you want to adjust it, move it around. If you want to make it bigger, uh, you can make it bigger. If you want to add a map to it, you can do the same. Just go to map and maybe you're looking for, uh, I'm in Salmia in Kuwait. For those of you on the other side of the world, this is where I am right now. Um, I can take this map image and plop that map in there. And have the students, if you create a My Map, you can install a My Map as well, um, you know, and do a ton of cool stuff with it. So you're you're all good to go. So right here, it's extremely easy. Um, you can see that you can add a calendar to it. You can add a map to it, docs, slides, all of that. So you're literally just pulling stuff from your Google Drive and adding things. So it's really easy to add things. It's really easy to move things around. If you don't like it, you can just resize it and, and um, delete it. It's not something that is rock science for creating the site. Now, what you do need to do is you do need to adjust and set some navigation, okay? So here we have a home page, which I click on home and you see that I have my home. If I go to schedule, it's going to take me to, let's say, the class schedule or maybe the Google Calendar that I have. And then the newsletter, however you set this up. These are all sub pages. So you have to remember that uh, a website is kind of like a file folder where you open it up and inside a file folder, you have a whole bunch of different folders. Okay. And all that the website is doing is it's just navigating to different folders. And schedule is just another page, which is basically like another folder. So if I go to pages, you will see here that I have these, these other pages, which is um, like a folder. And if I don't want it to say schedule, if I want this to say um, something different, 
all I can, oops, one second. All I have to do is just double click on it and allows me to change the name. So I can call this, let's say, resource info. And you'll see that it populates up here. And maybe I want this one to be uh, sports, or I'll call this clubs. I'm going to have some clubs in my class. Okay. So now, as I click on those pages, I'm editing those specific pages. If I want to edit a specific page, I just go to pages and I click on that page, and it allows me to. Um, go and work on that page. You can also, same as in your folders, add subfolders or sub pages, and this is important. So let's say in my clubs, I have four different clubs, and I want to share that information. So I could go. Oops, my apologies. I click click on this one, and you see that I have my snowman, my three buttons again. I'm going to go to either make home page, and if I make this my home page, pretty self-explanatory, but I go add sub page, and I'm gonna call this robotics. And then I'm gonna go to the snowman again under clubs, and I'm gonna go sub page, and I'm gonna call this uh, ed media. So now you'll see that under here, I am creating additional pages. But if I want to go to my Ed Media page, now I just scroll down and I can start editing my Ed Media page any way that I want to. Okay, so it makes it really easy to have this navigation. If I don't want my resource information to show up, I can click here and go hide from navigation. So I have resource media. Let's say that I create a page with a wealth of information, but I don't necessarily need it to show up in my navigation bar. If I go to, let's say, robotics, and I'm working on my robotics page, I can go back and create some text. And I'm going to create a text box and put it in here and say, uh, please see the resource page for the resources page oops my apologies for my spelling good thing we got spell check and then what i can do is i can select this and click the link button and you'll see now that i have the pages that are there so even though that one is hidden here's my let me change that so that it's shown up as uh, the regular page. There we go. Okay. Um, so now if I go back to my home page, I don't have that resources showing, but if I go back to, uh, was it Ed Media? <laughs> nope, it was under the robotics. If I go back to robotics, I can go to the resources page, and when I click on resources, it'll open up. Now, it didn't directly open up the resources page because I'm still in the edit mode. I'm not in the live mode, okay? So if you're looking at our agenda and what you need to do, when you're in your site, right now what it's doing is it's, there, it just went to the resources page. But when you wanna see what the page is gonna look like, you have this little button right here, which allows you to preview. So you click the preview, and it's gonna show you what it looks like on a computer or it's going to tell you what it's going to look like on a tablet or on a mobile phone. So maybe depending on how you're structuring your page, you can have a look at it. Okay, and then you want to go back to your edit mode. You just click the X button, exit the preview. And I'm working with, uh, let's say, Ms. Kolakar, and we're working on a, you know, a, a tech page for a bunch of our classes. I want to make her a collaborator. So she can edit the page. Again, all I'm doing is clicking that plus button. I type in her email address, and I can have her as an editor and give her the rights to be able to edit the document 
just the same as anything else. So she would have the ability to go in <clears throat> and do so. So Larry's asking, if a student create their own video, can I add that video to the site? Um, I guess that would depend on how the website is published. And let me show you that right now because it's the last thing that I need to show you. And I'll talk about that, Larry, is um, <clears throat> when you click on the publish button right here, it's going to give you uh, some options. And the first thing that you see right here is um, who can view my site. <clears throat> and the first thing is generally because you're in a school domain, you want just, let's say, the people within your school. And you don't want, if it's students, especially because of privacy rights and maybe the student has recorded somebody else in the video, you don't want these videos to go out in public. You want it just to stay within the school. You can manage this so that <clears throat> um, you choose who can see this. So you can go in and have it so that each student in the class is a viewer, which is a little painstaking because you have to um, put every student in there. Or if you create groups, uh, you can you know just add a group and say tech one and every student is in that. Um, but I would not recommend that you post the videos outside. Now, depending on what type of video it is, if they're creating, let's say, Wii videos and they publish it to YouTube and they have, again, private within the domain, then again, it'll be a YouTube video. It can go uh, onto the website. Um, you can't publish uh, your own, like, MOV files or MP4s. Uh, they can add them as links from the Google Drive but it's not going to be an, an embedded video like the YouTube video was. I hope that makes sense, Larry, and to everybody else. Okay, so here's the web address um, that it's going to show up as. It's going to say Mr. MS Tech because it's not recognizing, so it looks like Mr. and Mrs. So maybe I just, I'm going to remove that so it says Mr. M Tech Class. And if I press the publish button, this is going to go live to anybody at the um, at that little ed tech guy domain. So anybody within the school domain would be able to see it. Okay, or again, you can manage this. So once you publish it, that's it. Your site is going to be live within your school domain. And one of the perks, if you don't know this, uh, if you have a Google Edu account, you have unlimited storage space. So you never have to worry about it. Don't look at my account from yesterday um, and see that I have two terabytes because I pay monthly to have that uh, much storage. But if you're on your own private or if you're on a school account, um, students and you as teachers have unlimited storage space. Okay, uh, And that basically is everything that you need to know uh, for the, the test. Go through the task. And it's going to show you uh, what you need to do. Um, it's very easy. You need to basically add some text, add a header, change the picture, um, put a YouTube video in, and then you need to navigate and create sub pages and then publish it and share it. Uh, or, sorry, add, I believe you have to add a collaborator and boom, uh, you're good to go. So if you can go right now into your Google, well, not right now, but like later on in the next couple of days, create a Google site and do that, you'll be awesome. You're good to go, okay? So um, we have a little more content. I apologize, we have uh, 45 seconds left. Um, we've had a few people drop off. Hopefully you guys can stick around. Um, it's not gonna take uh, a ton of time for us to get through the last content. It'll probably take about 25 minutes uh, for me to get through it and then, uh, we should be good to go. Larry's asking about audio files. Uh, audio files, again, are just going to be uh, files that come from your Google Drive link. So yes, you can, but the students would have to upload them to your Google Drive or to their Google Drive and then add them to the Google Drive, but they won't come as embedded. Embedded meaning that it's actually inside and viewable. It'll just be a clickable link, OK? Um, all right, so let's go to Google Keep. Um, Google Keep, many people don't know about Google Keep. 
and uh, it is awesome. Um, I love it because it helps uh, me and my wife stay organized uh, because you can share uh, lists, you can share to-do lists, all this type of stuff. It's it just Google Keep is, is awesome. Um, it's one of those that, that I use just all the time to uh, keep myself organized or remember um, how to do stuff. So again, using that little typing, I'm going to go keep uh, dot new. And as I'm, we're waiting for this, take that selfie. Um, I want to see you guys Twitter because when you all take this test, the level one twet test, uh, I want to celebrate with you guys. Um, I don't know if you know what GEG is, but uh, GEG, which we'll talk about in a second, is Google Educator Groups. And uh, I own and run one of the Google Educator Groups for the Kuwait uh, to collaborate. And there's Google Educator Groups around the world. And I want to share uh, your successes um, and celebrate with you guys because getting a Google One certificate or a Google Two certificate is something you need to be extremely proud of. Okay, so. Take that selfie. Um, all right, a Google Keep. Um, it basically, it is like a giant sticky note. It is uh, one of those little agenda books, if you will, you carry around for notepads uh, for you as teachers. Um, you know, some people, I, I read a comment the other day that um, teachers have to submit their uh, lesson plan books or their uh, daily written agenda books to their administrators in, in the US. And I was like, what? That's crazy. Um, and this, you know, the guy was telling me that he spent a hundred bucks uh, to get this book designed so that it was his and all this type of stuff. And I'm like, dude, just use Google Keep. Like, it's so much easier. And share your Google Keep with your administrator if that's the case. Um, so Google Keep again is basically uh, whatever you want to call it: an organizing book, a, a daily agenda, a diary, if you will. Um, it's a great tool, and it can be used again for. Um, a plethora of things as far as you know you could uh, imagine okay um, but when you open up Google keep the first thing that prompts up is uh, a title and I'm gonna call this one Google certified educator uh, notes and that's the title of it and then in here this could be uh, take a selfie okay post on YouTube Oops, post on Twitter. And I'm like, well, I don't like that. Um, I would prefer it uh, maybe <clears throat> to look like checkboxes. So I want checkboxes instead. Um, pass level one test and so on and so forth, okay? So I can continue to uh, add list items. If I want to add a picture, I can add a picture. Um, I had um, one of my music teachers and uh, colleagues um, say, hey, uh, you know, what can I do with uh, Google Classroom and um, or Google Keeps? And I said, well, what if you like use Google Keeps for your kids to uh, keep daily uh, records or daily records of their um, music practice. So, you know, just a way for them to practice it. It could be them taking a, a selfie video or, or them, you know, taking a picture of their music or uh, the music sheets are sent and, and then, you know, just or recording their time so that they have that in there. And again, you could use Google Forms for that and then it gets put to a Google Sheet, all this. I mean, there's so many different things, but again, um, it's just, you can be as creative as you want with this. But in this situation, as I was saying to you, you could just create a notes folder or for all of us, we're stuck in staff meetings, um, you know, and our, our administrators give us agendas and then we got to take notes and, and we're always flipping back to going through that. So let's pretend that this, this right here is uh, a staff meeting and I'm going to close this. So I have this notes right in here, and I've added this little Bitmoji image of me. Um, and I've created a note, but I, I don't like that these notes just keep showing up everywhere. I want to uh, have it put someplace so um, you can see that I have a, a pin right here, or I have a label that says staff meeting. So 
if I want to edit labels, I can click on edit labels and I can create a new one and I'm going to call this Google Certified Educator Bootcamp and go done. So here I have my Google Certified uh, Bootcamp and in here, same as before, <clears throat> oops, where's my little add a label right here and I'm going to go bootcamp right there. So I can have these and I can hide the checkboxes if I need to, but when I go and I'm looking specifically for my staff notes, this might be where I have my staff notes and then again I can click on this one and maybe rather than have a checklist, I don't want checkboxes. I just go to the next line and I say October meeting and then I put my notes that I need to right here. Then I go to November meeting. I put my notes right here and I close that and then it's always in my staff meeting. So now if uh, that one's just posted in my regular notes file, but if I wanted to continue on with staff meeting notes, I can go right here staff meeting notes and now the same thing pops up and I'm going to create new notes that put inside here. You're literally just creating a simple agenda or an agenda book and it works great with your um, PLNs, with your teams in your schools because you can just go who's a collaborator and add a person as a collaborator same as you do with anything else and then click save and they're a collaborator. With my wife and I, um, I'm a Google person. I use a, a Google phone and I have the Google Home and all, just, I might be too googly. But um, if you use uh, Google Assist at all, I can just say, hey Google, add milk to the shopping list. Um, and then it automatically just, here's a summary for, oops it automatically just adds milk to the shopping list and my wife and I see it. Um, and then we just click off the checkbox. Again, what you can do with this is endless. It's entirely up to you. But as you look at what you need to do is you just need to create a to-do list, which I basically just showed you uh, with the, let's say the Google Keep meeting, um, where we have add media and share the notes. That's what we just did. I just added media to it, okay? And in sharing it, I just added a collaborator. If you wanna change the color of it, you can change the color. And as we look at this, edit the labels, we just did that by adding the bootcamp by going edit labels and adding a label. If you need to retype it or change it, you can do that. And if we look at it, you're just collaborating, okay? So in the test, uh, they're gonna ask you to basically create a Google Keep and share it, uh, make a note or make a to-do list and share it with um, a specific person in the test. It's not rocket science. Play with it a little bit, um, share with somebody, and you'll see that it's, that it's super easy to use, okay? All right, on this slide, I was going to say let's take a jam, but we're 10 minutes over. And uh, I know that if my principal was talking for 10 minutes over, I'd be like, hey, Yalla, uh, it's time to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm past the clock already. And I know for some of you, uh, here we are in Kuwait. It's already 930 in the evening. And for some of you, you may need to fill up a coffee. Um, Google Calendar. Uh, this is such a powerful tool. Uh, but there is only a few things that you need to know within Google Calendar, and let's jump into Google Calendar. Same as all of the other apps, you can open a new browser window and start typing calendar, or you can just click on your waffle button and go to calendar. And I'm gonna open up calendar. If we look at what we need to learn, we need to uh, create an event invite people to use it. We need to reserve a room. I'll explain that in one second. 
choose an event time, save and update events, respond to invitations, add reminders, and share and view your calendar, and add a Google Meet, which is an extra. So for all of you, uh, you had received a Google Calendar event, uh, invite for me with the information for this. Uh, some of you denied it. Um, some of you put tentative. Some of you said yes. Um, so I just did that for the sole purpose that you would get a little bit of experiences to see on the back end what the end user will get. So creating an event uh, is super easy. When your calendar populates, it's gonna show like any other a calendar. Um, and all you need to do is, we're looking at today, you'll see, oops. We're looking at today, all we need to do is uh, click on a date and put something in. So let me move to August. Uh, we're in Kuwait here and we've got some uh, Islamic holidays, some uh, Eid showing up. So let's say uh, next Tuesday, we decide to meet again, hypothetically. I'm just gonna double click on Tuesday and that's gonna open up this right here. And I could say Google Certified Educator Bootcamp 2. One thing to take note of is it defaults to all day. So you wanna uncheck this and then we'll give you the time so let's say we're gonna meet at 6.30 p.m. again to 9.30, whoops. Okay, I'm gonna go late, 9.30. Um, time zone, this is a good one for some of you uh, who received this, I press time zone, so it says I'm in plus three GMT, standard Arabia time in Riyadh, and I click okay. When you get that invite, then if you're sharing over time zones, then it should default to what your time is. Okay. Um, where it says location within schools, and when you do the test, they're going to have rooms set up and they might say choose the library. And in that situation, you're literally typing in where it says add location library. Um, so in your Google admin, your admin team can allocate every room to you. So within my school, I could set up, you know, the 300 classrooms. I could set up the four boardrooms. I could set up the two gymnasiums, the, the two swimming pools, the tennis courts, and all this type of stuff. So we can set all this up, and they do that so that you have room management within your building. So on the test, they're going to ask you to uh, possibly choose a room or location. Uh, for me... Um, you know, I'll just give you an example of how simple this is. I had a dentist appointment two days ago, uh, and I, my dentist appointment was at 09 clinic. So I literally typing 09 clinic and I didn't like, this isn't prompted because I typed in a calendar event on this user profile. It just Google artificial intelligence did that. So I could type in 09 clinic and away we go. Uh, I can set a reminder, a notification in 10 minutes, or maybe I want it in 10 days or 10 weeks for you guys with what I set up. I believe it was an hour before and then half hour to as a reminder. Uh, here you can choose what you want, the color. So if you are managing different calendars or different types of events, whether they're birthdays or school events or staff meetings or, uh, you know, maybe family events, things like that, you can choose that. You can have um, whether you're busy or free. So you can say you're busy at that time and default visibility. And then here you can just add the body of you know message. So uh, within the invite that I sent you guys, um, it had uh, information about you know the YouTube links and and whatnot. And then you see you can add guests. So originally I'm looking right now. There's 64 people. There was over 350 people who registered for this event. So in this situation, what I did was I literally, uh, in the registration form, I took the column and I selected all of those email addresses. And then I literally went control V and whoop, 350 something people um, got invited to this calendar event. But I put see guest list, I unchecked that. 
so that you guys wouldn't see it. And then I left uh, invite others in case you wanted to invite people. Now, if you want to add a Google Meet, all you do is put add Google Meet. And that's it. Super easy. So it's going to give the Meet code, and you're ready to go. So when you send this off to your, your team, um, as soon as you press save, there's that event. And if you need to edit that event, all you're doing is just double clicking on it, and it opens it up for you to edit it. Okay, that's it. So you're adding reminders and um, uh, sharing them out to people. Okay, now your calendars, um, you can share your calendar. So if you look here in your settings, um, you can go to your settings. And in your settings, you can adjust uh, your time zone and what time format and what days of the week that you want. And if you want to uh, add a calendar, so if you have a staff member who, or maybe your administrators who say, here's our uh, sports calendar for just the sports events, um, you can go add calendar and you can just put the subscribe to it or you can create a new calendar. And that's basically, uh, for the most part, you know, all you need to do is be able to just add a calendar and create the events. Okay. Hopefully that works. As I read a, a comment about, can you share the slides? They are right at the beginning of the chat. So when the YouTube video gets published, uh, you'll be able to just go and scroll up into the chat and all the slides um, are there and you can uh, have access to all the information and resources. <clears throat> um, Google Meet, and that is about it uh, for calendar. I mean, calendar is awesome. Uh, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have my calendar on my phone. Um, it shows up every morning so that when I wake up, uh, the first thing that populates is here's my list of things to do. Uh, I have a bunch of other calendars that are shared, so I know events that are going on, Google events and, and all types of PD. So, um, again, calendar helps organize my life because I got way too many things that are happening um, in every day. All right, if we look at the slide deck and we go to the next topic, we're talking about Google Meets. I'm sharing this information with you. Oh, I know you guys are missing me. You're forgetting what I'm look like. And um, oops. So here I am. Uh, if you're looking at this information in the slide deck, the last information that I've gotten from Google is because of the changes that have taken place um, with Google Meets and everything that's going on, they've basically taken most of the questions out of Google Meets. Um, so when it comes to Google Hangouts, when it comes to Google Meet, when it comes to Google Chat, they're all the same, for the most part, the same. Google Hangouts, obviously, if you don't know what Hangouts are, but Hangouts is like a WhatsApp chat or it's a chat group. And that can still be used, um, but the before it used to be, you can go to Hangouts and start video chats and then kind of Meets, Hangouts migrated into Meets. So you can still use Google Hangouts as a chat function, but the video prompts you into a Google Meet. Uh, if for whatever reason um, there is questions, the only questions that you may face is that in Hangouts, you can have up to 25 people on a, a call, and in Google Meets, you can have up to 100 people call, but I'm pretty sure they got those out. Debbie. Do you get a t-shirt? <laughs> um, I'm a Google trainer and uh, I can't get swag. Uh, you can get a Google t-shirt if you go to the official Google merchandise. 
um, they're ridiculously expensive, or unless you do specific training for Google, then they give you some uh, freebie stuff. But otherwise, uh, no, I, I am I apologize. Even getting Google stickers um, is a tough sell. You got to go to like the Etsy conference, or you got to go to a big conference where Google's presenting, and then maybe they'll give out some 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 swag for you. But um, there is always the Google merchandise store. So Google uh, Hangouts, Google Meets, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Have um, the um, slide deck open, and if there is any questions, you can just resort back to there or use the support help desk, okay? But a colleague of mine, uh, a trainer, on June 19th, she went through both testing platforms. Uh, Megan Swoop, as I referred to again, uh, she went through ProctorU and Criterion to just double do a double check and no Google Meets uh, or Hangouts questions were uh, in the test. YouTube. All right. Press that subscribe button. Um, YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Uh, what do you need to know for YouTube? You need to be able to navigate and sign in. You need to create a channel. You need to subscribe <laughs> to me. Um, access playlists, create playlists, share playlists, safety modes, subtitles, and uploading. This is going to take us about uh, seven minutes, okay? Um, don't forget to press that subscribe button. Let me get to 100 so that I can change um, that silly URL to that little ed tech guy. All right, going to YouTube. Again, my favorite, just typing in YouTube or go to your waffle and click on the YouTube icon. Let me go full screen again. Click on the YouTube icon, and that will take you to YouTube. And it's going to default to uh, just your YouTube page. Now, for some of you, this is uh, a little bit important. Uh, for some of you, you have uh, never really, you've gone to YouTube, you searched videos, uh, but this is the one thing that, that really messes everybody up. Um, if you right now are following along with me, if you click on this button right here, you're in YouTube. So right now you're in the YouTube uh, dashboard and you click on your user profile, it's going to open up your YouTube channel. Okay. If it doesn't say your channel, you need to create a channel. So in the test, it's going to ask you to create a channel, and then it's going to ask you to create and share playlists. Now, most people always get this wrong because they know how to create a playlist, but they do it on their computer at school, but now they're presented with a new user profile, and they're like, I, I don't know, how, why can't I not create a, a playlist? And that's because you don't have a channel. So if yours says uh, create channel, then you need to create a channel, and then that's going to make you make it so that you have your own YouTube channel where you can share playlists, you can create playlists, you can you know post your own videos, upload your videos, all that type of stuff. So you need to create uh, a channel, okay? And all you simply do is create channel. A couple prompts show up saying you know what's the name that you're putting in, a couple other things, and you're done. You're off to the races, and now you have um, a YouTube channel. So uh, anything that you post, uh, any videos you upload are going to go to your channel. Okay. So you've created a channel. Boom, you're good to go. Now, uh, if you want to subscribe to channels, let's say um, here's one for uh, if we have any history or um, – you know, world history teachers or AP history teachers. Uh, I'm going to use a guy that I know by the name of Hip Hughes. Um, I'm going to scroll down right here and see Hip Hughes. And Hip Hughes creates these uh, great uh, videos for uh, social studies, world history, AP history, all that type of thing. Um, I don't. A couple of years ago, I came across him and uh, started sharing him his information with uh, teachers. 
But if you notice, whenever you uh, come across them, and for those of you who've done this, you'll see right now that it says subscribed. And that means because I've already subscribed to Hip Hughes. And if I go over to the left side of my screen where it says subscriptions, it says Hip Hughes, okay? So if I'm ever as a teacher going, okay, well, I'm, I'm looking for some content and I know that <clears throat> Hugh has some, I can just go to my subscription and click on Hip Hughes. Now, if you subscribe to someone, what that means is anytime they post a new video, you're gonna get an email that says, hey, uh, here's his information. Now, not only does he um, have some great stuff, it's a little higher level thinking for high school students, um, but he does present some great uh, teaching methodology and pedagogy. But again, if you're looking at uh, this information right here, now you, you have access to his entire playlist. So hopefully if you subscribe to me, um, you're going to see that, you know, in the next near future, there's going to be a whole bunch of videos that are posted about um, Google and Google Classroom and Jamboard and, and using the different tools <clears throat> within Google. So uh, that's how you subscribe to someone. Now, let's hypothetically say that you are working on, uh, I'm going to go to uh, his playlist right here and, and see what he's got. And he's got a playlist about, this is the top result. oops, my apologies. He's got, let's say, uh, US History Explained. And I'm going to click on the play all. Uh, I'm going to pause this. And his playlist should pop up here. Now, <clears throat> as a teacher, the reason why this is so important is because you need to curate what videos you want to use. and you know, it happens so often that you're planning a lesson and all of a sudden you just, oh, I need a YouTube video. So you, you quickly look for something and then you find the video and you post it in your Google Classroom or you post it in a Google form and then you forget about it. Um, but what you can do is once you've clicked and you've previewed a video, you will see that you have, because you've now created a, a channel, you have this save button. And by clicking the save button, Oops. By clicking the save button, it allows you now to either watch later or create new playlists. So I'm going to create a new playlist and I'm going to call it um, AP World History. And I'm going to make this in the Google playlist or um, how, or sorry, the YouTube playlist or the YouTube. Um, viewing ability public means anybody can search it anybody can find it it's out there for the entire world to see unlisted means only people with the link can view it so if you create a youtube video and you only want your kids to see it you can go unlisted and that just means that only people who have the link have the ability to see it nobody can find it on youtube if they go searching for it and private, um, it says only you can view is, it's only you, it means nobody can search it, it can't be unlisted. But private also, there's a, there's a, a little trick to it. Um, in private, you can also share it with specific people. You have the ability to share privately. So for instance, in my first bootcamp, uh, I only shared the bootcamp videos with the people who attended the sessions as a resource. This one I decided to put public so anybody can view it. Um, share the knowledge, share the love. Uh, let's get everybody googly. Let's get everybody certified. Um, so private uh, is only you. And I'm going to just make this public so everybody can see my playlists. Okay. So AP history, and I'm going to go create. Now again, what I've just created is a playlist for AP history. So maybe I'm going to go to uh, the next one, which is this video that um, Hip Hughes is explaining. And I like this one. And I'm going to go and I want to save this one because I'm doing, you know, let's say a, a world history lesson. I don't want to have to go searching for videos. Here we go. I've just 
click that one where it goes add to world history playlist. And then I just close this and, and I'm going to close or pause his video here. And when I go back to my hamburger, you will see now on the left hand side, it says AP world history. And if I click on AP world history, that's a playlist that I've created. So here is the playlist. So all of the videos that, I, that I'm looking for for that specific class are right here. I don't have to go hunting for them anymore. I can just, there they are. And let's hypothetically say that I get a new person show up on my team. It's a new school year. They're like, hey, you know, you got another social studies teacher who's jumping on board. And they say, do you have any resources to help me with this class? Because they just told me that I'm teaching the same class as you. It's a little different than what I've done before. You say, yeah, no problem. Here, I got something for you. Let me share my playlist with you. So you click on the playlist and you go to the little arrow, which is share. And again, this allows you to just copy the URL, throw in an email to your teaching partner or to your students and say, hey, I want you guys to watch these videos or here's the resources that I have. Away we go. This is awesome. We're good to go. Okay. So that is subscribing, accessing playlists, creating a playlist, sharing a playlist. And then um, the last couple is your closed captioning and looking at videos. So if you're watching a video, you will see that there is a CC button and that is uh, subtitles or closed captioning. So Google has the artificial intelligence been built into it. So this is fantastic if you are need um, you know assisted reading in the class uh, or anything like that. So you can just press the CC. You can press the settings button. You can speed it up. You can slow it down if you want to, and you can also change the resolution depending on the bandwidth that you have. Okay. And then lastly, for your YouTube channel specifically. Most of you are going to be within a school domain, but they're going to ask you to do this because um, you're not set up. You're uh, in the uh, sorry in your mock browser or in your mock uh, uh, user that they create for you. Oops, sorry. Uh, in the the user that they create for you, they're going to have it set up so that they want you to do this. And, and one of the options that you will have noticed in your school is that students will say, I can't access certain videos. And that's because uh, your school has um, turned on the safe search settings and they've already done this. But in the test, they don't actually have that safe search uh, settings put on. So you need to go to um, he click on your user and go to settings. Click on the settings button. And what the settings allows you to do, oops. Um, what the settings allows you to do is allows you to turn on the safe search. And what that means is um, it's not going to allow students to, uh, or your channel to have um, any inappropriate content that shows up. All right, give me one second. Here's a trainer fail right now. It should be right at the bottom in your settings. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking up over top of my monitor right now. In your settings, you will have a prompt right at the bottom. And I'm not sure why mine is not showing up. Um, it says restriction 
uh, I apologize for this one, but in your settings, you will have one that says restriction and the restrictions will say yes or no. And on the yes or no, oh, my apologies. Nope. Yeah, I don't have mine set up right now because I just set up this trainer account. Um, you'll have at the bottom of your screen, it says restrictions and there's literally a yes or no button. And yes means that you're putting safe search on and no means that it's wide open. Um, so safe search just means, I'll give you an example. In our school, uh, when they safe search, if the students try and play a Drake video with explicit language, um, it's going to filter that and say, you can't watch this video. And it also is smart enough to recognize through artificial intelligence that there's a whole bunch of girls in bikinis that are dancing around in there. So they're just, you know, making the connection between Kuwait um islamic values and yeah we don't need to show that because safe search is on so that's the restriction button it'll literally be right at the bottom i apologize um that it's not showing up for me so hopefully you guys will forgive me for this one okay um all right that covers youtube and uh the next one that we're going to uh is, again is going to be really quick and then we're almost done we got a few more minutes and that is Google Drawings. And if you've never used Google Drawings before, uh, most people are like, eh, you know, why use Google Drawings? It's, it's not that great of a tool. Um, if you go to your Omnibox and you type in uh, Drawings, you are not going to get Google Drawings show up, OK? You're going to need to go into your Google Apps or your Waffle and scroll down to Drawings. Or you go to your Google Drive. And again, here's just troubleshooting for all yours that you can see in Google Drive. I can go to New. And as it loads, there's drawings. All right, so I've created a drawing for you right now, demonstrating how you can use Google Drawing, OK? And in Google Drawing, um, what I've simply done is I've just added some clip art. And I've used this as an example that I talked about yesterday. Uh, about using um, Google Slides uh, as well as a tool to be able to use it within your classroom. So Google Drawings uh, is basically a draw tool that allows you to uh, add images, add some basic video clips, add uh, GIF files. And um, I mean, a lot of people are using this tool right now. And here's one way that I've used uh, Google Drawings is for Ed Media, I've taken basically a, a desk, mocking it as a broadcaster's table, and just demonstrating and putting these in here and giving this as an assignment in Google Classroom to the students and have said, um, OK, I want you to uh, demonstrate for me the uh, proper lighting to eliminate uh, any shadows in a green screen. So here uh, I would, if you guys remember, I would share this as a document to the students. And I would say, make a copy for each student. And then the students would be able to just take this and be able to rotate it around. You could use this to uh, create a simple Venn diagram. So if I went here and I go File, New Drawing, you could, um, within early years uh, students, you could just grab the circle tool once mine loads here, grab the circle tool, put shapes. And again, this is a great tool uh, for anybody for doing mind maps. So if you create a Venn diagram, control C, control V, and then if you just use some of your basic formatting where it says fill, I say transparent here, this one let's say again is transparent and 
if you were doing this as, uh, you know, let's say, uh, decide, uh, you know, meat eating animals, a carnivore or non carnivore, et cetera, et cetera. However, you set up a Venn diagram, you could get your students to just import pictures and create this. So in the uh, test, they're going to ask you to um, create a Google drawing and uh, you can use um, the <clears throat> Where is it on mine? You can use uh, clip arts. So if you go to images, you can just go to find images and they can add images. You can create any type of graphic organizer um, or as I said, a Venn diagram. So a graphic organizer could quite simply be uh, again, and this is you being a little bit creative, or if you Google examples, a graphic organizer could be you creating something and saying, you know, drawing a simple line tool, putting a line down it, and then using your text box right here, putting a text box in there and saying uh, veggie. And I'm just going to copy paste it, put it over here. And then as a teacher, you just go and grab a whole bunch of images uh, and you just put a whole bunch of veggies and fruits in here. And then you share this as a copy for all your students where you make a copy for each and they just drag and drop um, this, the simple, you know, vegetables back and forth. So as we are in uh, an age right now of um, paperless classrooms, and we're trying to think of how we can, you know, create the same activities without having paper. Uh, here's one of those where, you know, elementary teachers would quite simply, you know, give a piece of paper, here's some scissors, give a glue stick. You're doing the exact same thing. The only difference is that you're putting in Google Draw. You could also, if you wanted to be extremely creative, you could take a picture with your phone and then put the picture uh, as a background as well. And then, you know, just have it so that there are, dragging and dropping the fruits or the pieces uh, over top. So you really don't need to do a lot with Google Drawings. You just have to be familiar with it and you need to be able to use the simple tools, okay? All right, we're almost done. A few more minutes. We're going way longer than what I thought, I apologize. Google Groups. Google Groups um, is extremely, extremely powerful, um, but it's not anything that you have to set up um specifically for your class if i can show you uh, my groups on my screen right now um you can see that i have a, an all events i have a boot camp i have a, a google, geg socal i have a google certified coaches a trainers group and then a middle school group and i mean if we're going into the google trainers group right here there's um i don't know about 2700 active members right now and this literally just gets you know lit up so if you're looking right here from 2 44 a.m uh, all the way up to the top it just it doesn't stop of you know information that's being shared uh, and this is all basically just a, a pln an internal pln so google groups you can create by just going to groups in your um, Google domain and going through the process of setting it up. They don't ask you in the test to set up a Google group. Um, they will in level two, but not in level one, but it, it is nice to know uh, because they can be a super powerful tool uh, within your, your school. You can set up student groups, you can set up teacher groups, you can set up worldwide groups, um, it's endless. All you're basically doing is just doing, um, you know, you're adding people's email addresses. I had a, a girl from uh, the States email me in a Facebook uh, Google support group where maybe many of you saw this. And she's like, I'm a new uh, middle school technology teacher and I have zero resources. Can you guys help me? And I said, well, I'll set up a group for you. And we can just, whoever's interested, fill in this Google form and I'll just put them into the group and then we can create a collaborative area for all this, you know, 
uh, sharing of information. And like within 20 minutes, uh, I created a Google group. And then all of a sudden, we had about 150 teachers join. And she literally had all, all of her content for her grade seven technology class. She's like, this is incredible. And people were just having conversations and sharing and sharing and sharing. And she's like, this is awesome. Um, and I know you may find like Facebook groups where like, okay, well, I can get a, a lot of information, but then you got to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and find it, go through all the junk that you don't want. This literally was, you know, just boom right there. So if you're looking at the sheet, um, it's more so being aware of what Google groups are and Google groups are what I just, you know, told you is you're collaborating. You can set up a specific group and collaborate with a bunch of teachers uh, as long as you have their email address. Okay. And as a, a moderator of the group, you can decide who can post, who can't post. But again, you don't need to, you don't need to know that specifically uh, for the, for the test. I love that we got people uh, answering questions uh, in there. Um, do we need to know Google groups such as voice call, etc.? No, you don't. Um, all of that is still relatively new where it talks about um, voice call. What you do need to know um, for the test um, is it's been phased out. It used to be called G+. Uh, and now if you go into your waffle menu, it's don't think it's going to show up on mine because I'm in my trainer account, but it's called currents and um, currents. It's not, yeah, it's not showing mine. Currents is the old G plus and they, they're, they're reinventing it. Um, it. It's basically, no, it's not going to prompt. I have to load it into the trainer group. Um, you don't need to know about currents. Uh, but they've taken the G plus comments out of there. But what you do need to do on your test, and this is important. Um, so I've given you a task as well. You need to be able to go back to your uh, testing uh, domain to the training websites. So if you go to edu.google, oops, I can't even spell Google right now, google.com. First, you'll have to unlock your. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I have a Google phone, so Google Assist is on there, so it always wants to, always wants to talk. You you need to know this. So follow the steps, okay? Um, you need to go to one of your trainer domains. Either you use uh, Criterion and you go to uh, Teacher Trainer uh, Google. Google search that; it'll take you to the Criterion website, or you go edu.google.com. If you go edu.google.com, you're going to get linked to sure, the. But first, you'll have to unlock your device. Sorry. Um, if you go and you're on the ProctorU website, go to training and support and go training and PD. Now, you can also Google search this. But one of the first things that you're going to see is train with an expert. And they're going to ask you in the test to find a trainer within 50 kilometers or 50 miles of, I don't know, California or something like that. But what you need to do is go train with an expert and you click on find a local expert. Wow, I've gone 45 minutes over. And as you scroll down, you can say, okay, I'm looking for a Google trainer. They might ask you for a trainer or an innovator. They won't ask you for a coach because coach just started about a month ago. So if you go search this type of expert, it's automatically going to default to um, your location. And it's going to give you a, this one saying show map. And thankfully, <laughs> you can see that I'm an actual trainer because I'm on the Google website saying that I'm a certified trainer. But this isn't what you want. You are looking uh, specifically uh, for somebody in a certain region. So here is where you would go to filters. 
and say, who am I looking for? I'm looking for teacher training and in what products I'm looking for G Suite for education. I don't need any of that. Um, and I want to connect with a, if they ask you a trainer or an innovator, you say yes. And then you say, I need help with this location. And you can say um, 25 miles of, and there you can see I've put in Dallas. Well, let's put in Dallas and then see the results. And it's going to show you who um, are the trainers within that area, okay? And that's important to know because they're going to ask you that one uh, because as you uh, go further with your Google journey, uh, you may need people to assist um, in helping you train in your school. Or more importantly, trainers just reach out to a trainer and say, hey, I'm trying to do this with my school. Can you help me? Um, and oftentimes they're going to say yes. I, there hasn't been a trainer that I have come across that have said, no, you can't have my material. Um, because being googly is all about um, making the students better. And if we're not sharing, as we say to our students, sharing is caring. Uh, we're just not caring. So if you have material, um, share it. Um, help another teacher, help other educators become better at their craft, especially uh, using technology. So. Uh, that is how you find uh, other trainers or innovators in the world. And again, at the end, um, I've given you um, the link to, I'm going to put myself up here again for a few minutes. I've given you the link to this resource page uh, that has a wealth of information. Again, it's connected back to the Google training site because um, it's pointless for me to sit and type up information that says, here's how to add uh, a picture to a Google slide deck when Google's already done that for me and that's the information they're looking for. So um, everybody, everybody is, every trainer resources back to uh, the Google support desk because that's what Google wants you to do. So I've given you uh, this slide deck, you have the scenarios. Um, if you can go through and, and master the scenarios, you're good to go. And lastly um, is uh, the survey. Uh, most of you have filled it in yesterday. You gave me some great feedback. Hopefully I was able to um, meet the needs of, of some of you who, today who gave me that great feedback. It was much appreciated. Uh, you are going to get your uh, three hours. If you want me to change this to four hours, uh, stick around for a minute. Don't fill in the comments right now. If you want me to change today's sessions to four hours because it's valuable to you, I need you to give me a day to update that uh, certificate and um, fill it in today, If you, uh, fill it in tomorrow. If you're happy with three hours right now, uh, fill it in and you'll get that automatic uh, three hours right now. But um, given that it's uh, already an hour past, uh, I'm not going to have time to do that tonight. So uh, I hope this was beneficial to all of you. Uh, remember, take that selfie. I want to see uh, it lit up in Twitter. And um, one of the important things is grow with Google. Grow with Google, hashtag, and Google EDU. Forget me, that little ed tech guy. I'm, I'm irrelevant. I'm, I'm a small pe person in the world. Hopefully, uh, this might help you and make a difference. But uh, if you get on Twitter and you can follow grow with Google and Google EDU, uh, again, it may be a game changer for you because you're going to, the wealth of information that you're going to get, uh, is just incredible. So again, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for, to the 54 people who stuck around and, um, hopefully again, this is beneficial. I'll stick around for, uh, a couple minutes. If anybody has any, um, uh, specific questions uh, that they may want answered. I'll trim the questions out at the end of the video. Um, so you are more than happy to uh, stick around and type in those questions and, and I'll answer those questions, but it won't be on the video. So give me a second and uh, let me just close out the session right now with uh, my little thing right here. Hey, it's Les here, that little ed tech guy. Thanks for watching the video. 
Be sure to press the subscribe button and stay tuned for more videos. Cheers! All right, I'm back, and I am happy to... Uh,